And great having Scott here. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. So sorry about the technical issues. Yeah, are you serious? What does that sound to me? Sure, you can please install the Zoom audio device. Okay, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Pete Carmichael of the Civil War Institute, and as you can tell, it is not June, it is April. I'm on the Antietam battlefield, and I'm here today uh, to introduce to you Scott Hartwig. As many of you know, Scott Hartwig was a longtime chief of interpretation at Gettysburg, and it only makes sense he has devoted his life work to writing a book on Antietam. And he, in fact, just last week uh, finished the second volume of his study on the Antietam campaign. What we're doing today is we're going to have six different stops at these different stops. Scott will uh, be having a conversation with members of the Civil War Institute staff. Uh, those members include uh, graduating seniors, Ben Roy, Cameron Sowers. Uh, they are leaving the nest and heading off to graduate school next year. And we're also joined by Dr. Ashley Olosky, who is the assistant director of CWI. So after each one of these stops, uh, we're going to take a 
live break of sorts. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to send in questions to ask. Scott will be uh, in the uh, studio, so to speak, and uh, we'll be able to continue the conversation. I want to stress that we are not here to give you an overview of the Battle of Antietam. Rather, uh, it is our job today to get to the spots that uh, I would say mean something to, to Mr. Hartwig here, and we're going to get his insights and, again, looking forward to the conversation with him and excited for you all to join us. I want to also say that we are so appreciative of you all joining us for our virtual conference and want to remind you all that um, if you would like, uh, please donate to the Civil War Institute cause. Two of our students today, they have benefited immensely from the programs uh, that we have been able to provide, including internships. Uh, both of these uh, students, they both were Pohanka interns. They worked at various uh, historical Civil War sites. So again, thank you so much for watching. And, and again, we appreciate uh, your support. Let me just quickly again introduce Scott. Scott, why don't you step in here? And uh, again, it is truly miserable. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but we're, again, we're very excited for you to be here, Scott. Thank you so much for uh, uh, spending the, the frigid day with us. And it's going to be great. It, it, there'll be an occasional wind shear that we'll have to watch out for, but outside of that, I think it'll be uh, just fine. Small snow, snow storm. <laughs> We've already had a little bit of snow, in fact. Yeah. So uh, we're going to take a quick break here, but our first stop is going to be Scott. And we're, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Rufus Dawes in the 6th Wisconsin and the uh, David Miller cornfield. Good. Fantastic. Okay. We'll see you at our next stop. Uh, I'm Pete Carmichael of the Civil War. So, Scott, we're standing here at the edge of the iconic cornfield, one of the most famous landscapes on the Antietam battlefield, and the site of some of the most brutal combat to take place uh, during the day on September 17th. I'm wondering, before we get into our, our primary source with Rufus Dawes uh, in the 6th Wisconsin, who fought uh, right around this area, if you could give us some kind of orientation geographically as to where we are in terms of the entire battlefield landscape and in terms of the timeline of, of how the battle unfolds. Yeah, we're on the we're on the north end of the battlefield, and it uh, when we hear Dawes's account, it's about a little bit after six o'clock in the morning, maybe between six and six thirty in the morning, and uh, right behind me, this uh, Virginia rail fence. Dawes is going to describe a fence just like that, and right behind that was the David Miller cornfield, which becomes known as the cornfield. And what's happening is uh, General Joseph Hooker's First Corps is attacking down through the cornfield against Confederate soldiers who are to the south of us, down towards what we call the Dunker Church Plateau, near where the, today the park has its visitor center. So we have the cornfield right behind us. The Miller Farm is back there in the distance from us. This is the rail fence he's talking about. The Confederate position was actually in the field. Uh, you can kind of see it today. There's a there's a, a, a slight a tree line out there, but that's where the Confederates were located, who uh, Dawes is going to describe rise up and begin to fire at his line. And uh, the, the combat that Dawes describes is right on the very ground we're standing on here. Great. So um, with that introduction, I think let's get into the uh, the primary source. Now, this comes from a memoir that Rufus Dawes wrote in 1890. Is that correct? It was, it was about, that, yeah, yeah um, about his time fighting with the 6th Wisconsin. Of course, he saw many, many brutal battles uh, during his time with the regiment. You want me to hold the microphone? Sure, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah, there we go. All right, so. We'll get into it. And of course, this comes in the middle of Dawes's uh, description of what happens here in the cornfield. At the front edge of the cornfield was a low Virginia rail fence, what Scott has just pointed out to us. Before the corn were open fields, beyond which was a strip of wood surrounding a little church, the Dunker Church. As we appeared at the edge of the corn, a long line of men in butternut and gray rose up from the ground. Simultaneously, the hostile battle lines opened a tremendous fire upon each other. Men, I cannot say, fell. They were knocked out of the ranks by dozens, but we jumped over the fence and pushed on, loading, firing, and shouting as we advanced. 
there was on the part of men great hysterical excitement, eagerness to go forward, and a reckless dis disregard of life, of everything but victory. Captain Kellogg brought his companies up abreast of us on the turnpike. The 14th Brooklyn Regiment, red-legged Zouavs, came into our line, closing the awful gaps. Now is the pinch. Men and officers of New York and Wisconsin are fused into a common mass in the frantic struggle to shoot fast. Everybody tears cartridges, loads, passes guns, or shoots. Men are falling in their places or running back into the corn. The soldier who is shooting is furious in his energy. The soldier who is shot looks around for help with an imploring agony of death on his face. So Scott, this is a great description of what it was like to be in the midst of this nightmarish battle um, can you tell us a little bit about why you selected this particular account to help us uh, illuminate uh, some of the themes that we see unfolding here uh, in the cornfield at this point in the battle? Yeah, uh, Dawes' account is probably one of the finest combat accounts of any battle in the Civil War. And uh, he, he sees a lot of combat in the war, Dawes, but he also, uh, he has a unique ability to bring it alive and to make you feel it and understand it. Uh, he goes through the entire war and is never shot. In, in the Battle of Antietam, he comes the closest. He actually, when they're retreating, a bullet nicks his, his leg and kind of creases his skin. And he has, after the war is over, I think some tremendous survivor's guilt. Uh, why did he survive? And a lot of these men that he knew who died. And he wanted to tell their story, and he wanted to tell it honestly, as honestly as he possibly could. And that's one of the things that's always struck me about his book, Service with the Six Wisconsin Volunteers, is the honesty of it. And and the other thing about it is Dawes never makes it about Dawes. He makes it about his men who he served with and who he led. He wants to tell their story. He wants you to feel what they went through. And he wants you to understand what the combat was like. So uh, the things that are interesting to me in it, he talks about a reckless disregard of life. Now, most people, when they think about soldiers, because most people today have never been in combat. So when they think about soldiers in combat, they think everyone is terrified. Well, every they are afraid. They are afraid. But adrenaline is pumping through their body. And what that causes some of these men to do, as Dawes is saying, they're just not thinking about getting shot. They're just, they're... There's just this reckless disregard of life, and they just want to get the guys who are shooting at them. So everybody's active, you know, passing rifles to each other, firing, shouting, yelling. Uh, it's almost like a demonic um, force has, has seized these men in this moment. And I think battle can bring that on in men. That's what Dawes is trying to help people understand. And I thought his account is good to help us understand some phases of this battle at Antietam are um, they're really brutal and violent. And oftentimes we try to dwell upon those aspects of a battle where both sides kind of showed respect to each other or um, they spared somebody's life or whatever. And they, we, the, the more unseemly aspects of it, which tended to be more predominant, we try to overlook those. Yeah, I think it's easy for us, again, people especially who've never seen combat before, to sanitize a lot of what we see and what we understand about the battle, especially at a place as, as beautiful um, as a 21st century uh, look at a 19th century battlefield. Um, I'm curious, as just a follow-up, um, get the hair out of my face. <laughs> As a follow-up to your description of how Dawes does write, it did strike me when reading this, he doesn't mince his words, it is a graphic depiction of the battle, um, it's not about him. How does his memoir compare with other memoirs that you've read, looking back about the same period, you know, uh, 30 years or so after the battle? Does he stand out? Is he unique in that regard? Is he, do you see more common elements of that among certain classes or certain types of, of soldiers or officers? Um, or, or is he really kind of a more unique individual in the way that he represents uh, battle? Yeah, I think he's more unique uh, in his honesty uh, of describing battle, also his honesty in not making himself the central character, and his, uh, he, he, he's not so graphic that he tells you everything 
that he actually saw. But he tells you enough that you realize that this wasn't some sort of a heroic game. This wasn't some sanitized uh, conflict. This was this was um, frightening and disturbing. And he even uh, the other thing I like about it too is when they get counterattacked by Hood's Texans, they got to run for their lives. And he is completely honest again about, I ran as fast as I could. In fact, he writes a letter to um, John Gould, who was, a, uh, he was a, in the battle, but he also was a historian of the battle. And uh, Gould was uh, studying the battle and trying to learn different aspects of the battle. And so he corresponded with a lot of veterans. And in one of the letters that Dawes wrote to him, Dawes admits in this letter, which I thought was fantastic, he says, um, I was a pretty good sprinter. How fast he was trying to run to the rear to get away from the Confederates who were attacking him. So uh, that aspect of Dawes I always found appealing. He, he never asked his men to do anything he wouldn't do. He always gave his men full credit for everything. He didn't try to claim credit for things that maybe he didn't do. And even there were things that he did he could have claimed credit for it that he didn't. So we, we, we see Dawes as a fully human person who uh, has flaws. He's not perfect. He, he isn't the best. He isn't like the most ideal leader. He's not trying to say he is. But in the end, he's the sort of leader that these men will follow. He's a really good leader. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely, that's one of the huge takeaways um, from his account from here and, and from other accounts um, of other battles that he's in. Um, so you said that you like to, to use Dawes's account to kind of walk us through um, the battle as a whole. Um, how does his account play into your your book on Antietam? How, how do you use him? Is it in different ways than you've already talked about? Um, or what, what kind of role does he play there? Well, again, because he's such a good writer, you know, you can't help but uh, use a few block quotes from Dawes. So um, he just, he's so descriptive in this part of the fight that uh, it's rare. I mean, it's very rare that an individual is able to articulate what they experience in words. It's very hard for people to do that, I think. And he's so good at it. So I, I try to... Um, not overemphasize Dawes because um, he is one man, but I I use his account to also show the um, the challenge that he faces. He's 23 years old. He's laying down on his face in the cornfield back here before they come out of the corn, and uh, the sergeant major comes to him through the corn, and the corn's seven to eight feet tall. So they're being shelled also, not by the Confederates, but by their own artillery. And that artillery kills one lieutenant, wounds another lieutenant in one of the companies, and, and inflicts a, a few other casualties. And then he gets he gets told by the sergeant major, hey, uh, Colonel Bragg needs to see you at the, at the turnpike. So he runs over to the Hagerstown turnpike. He finds Bragg, and Bragg says, I've been shot, you're in command, and falls over. So after this incident happens, now Dawes, 23 years old, now he's in command. And any of us who've been in a situation where we're like the second in command or third in command, we're not really completely responsible, that realization now, I'm responsible, is a big deal. And he, Dawes kind of admits that he's not sure what, he, what to do. So he's standing over at the Hagerstown Pike and he sees some... Confederate horsemen, or probably an officer and his staff, probably over towards the West Woods. So he tells some of his men to give them their his, their rifles to him, and he fires like five shots at these guys. And that's not his job. His job is not to fire a weapon at the enemy. His job is direct his soldiers. So I see that as it's very human of Dawes. He's telling us, I didn't really know what to do at this moment. But he, he's going to pull himself together. He's going to perform really, really well. And um, he just is a, uh, I think when you're trying to write about these things, um, ultimately the movement of soldiers, you need to understand what the movement of soldiers is to follow the battle action. But it's the people that you can identify with and that, that bring these, these historical events to life. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And just that perfect description of him emerging from the cornfield and then seeing, oh my God, what's in front of me? And yeah. you know, this line of Confederates rising up. Uh, it, it brings the battle to life um, in a way that, that, yeah, I think few other soldiers or, or officers are able to do so honestly. And then, as you said, his description of the retreat being so honest and, you know, the back and forth of the battle, the ebb and flow, it's not, you know, a one glorious charge and the enemy right. is swept from the field. Right. Um, it's it's back and forth and, you know, this isn't some inevitable victory that's taking place here. Um, so again, yeah, it just really, really brings to life an iconic portion of uh, the landscape. Another thing that Dawes does, too, in his account is uh, he, he tells a lot of little vignettes of some of his men. Yeah. Like uh, one of his men, I think his name was Tomlinson, um, he said that, uh, you know, before they'd ever gotten into combat, Tomlinson was kind of a, he was always boasting about what he was going to do when he got into battle. And usually when you read those stories, when those people get into battle, they perform really badly or they're cowardly or whatever. But Tomlinson wasn't. Tomlinson was like really brave and he's out here near where we're standing and talking right now and when they started to retreat Hood's men are counterattacking he remembers Tomlinson turning with this imploring look on his face and shouting to the men you ain't leaving are you I still have some cartridges left so he wants to keep shooting at these guys and everybody else is like we got to get out of here now but he, those stories that he tells again it that's the thing of about Dawes I like. He always wants us to know something about the people that he served with. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And the fact that you do rely on him as a key figure in your book, I mean, I imagine that that's how, that is how you approach military history as well, is, is getting at the key figures of humanity, how these individuals process and try to understand uh, what's unfolding around them in a very chaotic and somewhat understandable, non-understandable uh, way. Um, so that's that's exciting. Um, this is a great way to, to open up our, our tour of the yeah. battlefield today, Scott. Thank you. Um, we will close for now, and we'll, of course, take a short break for a live Q&A, and then we'll move to our next stop. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cameron Cyrus here for the Civil War Institute. We're back with Scott Hartwig on the Antietam Battlefield. We're just off to the side of the East Woods, which are currently being rehabilitated by the National Park Service here. This section of our stop is gonna focus on Frank Shell, who is an illustrator for Frank Leslie's Illustrated, uh, who is traveling with the Army of the Potomac during the battle. And he sketches a scene that takes place in this area, which you can see now on your screen. Our cameraman is gonna show it. And we have the famous Dr. Carmichael holding it. We're putting him to good use today. So Scott, I'm wondering if you can just kind of orient us now to where we are on the battlefield and what our audience is seeing off behind us. Yeah, we've moved east from where we were at our first stop where we were talking about Dawes. Dawes is, uh, you can see the uh, monuments up there on the hill behind us. That's where we were. We've moved east and we're at the southeast corner of Miller's Cornfield or the Cornfield. And in this uh, sketch that uh, Shell did, you see Vanneman's Maryland battery, which was actually a six core artillery battery. The Union Army, after the uh, morning fighting, had subsided in this area. So we've had the attack of the first corps, the attack of the 12th corps, they actually drove the Confederates uh, completely out of this area. Then Sedgwick's division arrived, went into the West Woods, and they got slaughtered attacked and driven out of here and the Federals placed a large number of artillery batteries across the front of the East Woods facing towards the West Woods facing west so Vanneman's battery is is right over here in fact when you look at his sketch it's a really really good sketch because you can see the lay of the terrain exactly the way it is in the sketch on the landscape here so Vanneman was actually in the corn and his job along with all these other batteries which were either to 
to our right and to our left. Their job, because the federal high command in this area thought the Confederates were really strong and they were afraid of a Confederate attack. So their job was to uh, defend the Union position here and keep the Confederate attackers back. The woods behind us, the East Woods, which actually extended a little bit down to the south of us as well, it was the scene of very heavy fighting in the morning, in the morning battle. And it had been held by both armies. It was held by the Union Army first, then the Confederates took it, and then the Union Army took it back again. And what uh, uh, Shell is depicting in there is most of the men you see in the foreground are Confederate soldiers. And they are some of the soldiers who came in and took the woods during the morning fighting. When Hood's, Hood's division counterattacked the First Corps, uh, two of his regiments, the 4th Alabama and the 5th Texas, enter the woods, and they're joined by uh, members of the 21st Georgia. They stay in here for over an hour fighting in the woods, and um, their story is very poorly documented because the senior officer was, uh, was a, uh, a captain named William McKenna Robbins. He was from the 4th Alabama. And after the battle was over, uh, Robbins had a couple of really horrific incidents that happen in the battle. His brother was killed in the woods here. And before they made the attack with Hood's division, they were in the West Woods, and he was talking to a lieutenant who was a friend of his. This was before they go into action, and they were under artillery fire, and a Union shell came in and took the head off of the lieutenant who was talking to Robbins. So when we talk about trauma, uh, Robbins was really exposed to some trauma. So Robbins writes years later, he says, I never wrote a report about Antietam or Sharpsburg because I was sick for a number of weeks after the battle. Now I've looked at uh, Robbins military service records and I don't find any evidence that Robbins ever went to a hospital that he had a physical sickness like he had typhoid or something like that. I think that Robbins was suffering from uh, stress uh, uh, from the battle. So he doesn't write a report and consequently, when uh, John Bell Hood and William Wofford and Evander Law are writing their reports of the battle, they don't really mention anything about what these guys did in here. Well, uh, Shell says that some of the men that you see in the foreground are Georgians. So they have to be, they're either from the 21st Georgia or a little bit later in the fighting, the 6th Georgia Infantry the edge of the of that or the right of that regiment was actually on the edge of the cornfield here and that regiment possibly suffered the highest losses of any confederate regiment percentage wise of the battle of, of antietam i say possibly because the unit that is documented to have suffered the highest percentage loss is the first texas infantry but the sixth georgia their losses were so high, I don't think everyone, anyone ever knew exactly what their losses were because they lost so many officers and men. Uh, but it's possible some of the people that are, that are in that image by Shell are uh, some of these men from the 6th Georgia. In our last stop, you gave a really moving account from Rufus Dawes about the battle, uh, but that's words that's easy for a historian to translate back onto the paper. I was wondering if you could talk about the challenges and the benefits of working with an image like that that gives us such a powerful and moving scene, um, how you make that into words and how that can help us understand what happens here at Antietam. Well, the thing about Shell's sketches is uh, they're... Um Many of the sketches that you see people drew are trying to, to uh, depict the dramatic. And he's not trying to show the dramatic here. He's just, this is the battle right here in front of you. You see, uh, I think the one person is a, uh, the father, he's lying there dead. And his son, who is in the same unit, is laying at his feet and he has a shattered uh, leg. So Shell is showing us this was the battle. This this is the ugly side of war. And uh, there's nothing heroic in Shell's sketch there. So what I look at, when I look at um, artist renditions of 
a battle like Antietam, uh, many of them you can kind of discount because they're they're trying to uh, they're trying to to present the dramatic, and sometimes they're going to err on the side of uh, not showing the realities of the battle. But someone like Shell, you can certainly use what he did there because he's telling it like he's trying to tell it like it is what he saw. Yeah, I think I think that's interesting because especially so many times we see with the newspaper images, especially trying to reach the audience and wondering how an image like that really impacts the way the casualty reports of Antietam are perceived in the North. You have so many casualties and you see an image like that that's shocking as opposed to something more heroic. Now, Shell also leaves some written accounts of the battle, too. How do you feel about using the newspaper men? How do you combine their written accounts and their visual accounts uh, of the battle into the primary sources we typically use of soldiers who are here? Yeah, Shell's written account. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure he wrote that a uh, while after the war. So you always have to be a little bit cautious about using those because um, sometimes their memory isn't clear about all the places they were and when they were in those places, and so they sometimes can mix. They actually saw something, let's say, over in the West Woods, but they think it happened over here in the East Woods. And they, so you have to be careful and you always have to try and uh, find other accounts and corroborate what they said. Um, you know, there's a great, uh, one of the great uh, pieces of reporting of the battle was done by, um, I just forgot his name. He was a reporter for the um, New York Tribune. Um, I got shell on my mind. Um, I just forgot his name. You guys remember the name of the guy? It was the uh, he he was with Hooker. He was riding around with Hooker. Gosh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, yeah, I mean, we'll Google it. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll have the answer in the Q and A. We'll start with an we'll start with an answer in the Q and A section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he he uh, publishes his. Um, his account of the battle on September the 19th. He gets out of Antietam on the night of the 17th. He manages to get a train that takes him to Baltimore. From Baltimore, he goes to New York City. He arrives in New York City very early in the morning of the 19th. And while he was on the train, he was writing his story. It's great reporting, but some of the some of the pieces of it, you're like, that's just for the consumption of the New York City reader. That's not what actually you saw. You know, that's not what really happened. Even some of the uh, veterans I've read accounts from some of these veterans who read his uh, who read his newspaper article uh, afterwards, and they're like, "Hey, uh, he said some really nice things about us, but that's not really what happened." Yeah. So um, you you have to always be careful with some of these. Uh, um, it's, it's much different than reporters today who are trying to be very objective and tell you what they saw in front of them. They're trying to report, but they want to be objective. They were less concerned about being objective. They, they, um, they wanted to sell papers. Uh, that's what makes Shell's uh, sketches, I think, so interesting, is that um, he's really trying to show you the battlefield as it was. Yeah, I mean, Shell's image is a great one to be out here on the battlefield. Scott, thank you so much for uh, joining us out here today, and we'll see everyone at our next virtual tour stop. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Benjamin Roy. I'm a fellow at the Civil War Institute. We're out here on the Antietam Battlefield near the Dunker Church with Scott Hartwig talking about his new book on the Battle of Antietam. And we're specifically gonna be talking about a photograph of Knapp's battery taken by uh, Matthew Brady. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about its significance, its, pri its prior interpretation by historian uh, William Frazzanito. But before we get into that, Scott, explain to us Orient us, where are the Confederates? Where are the Union soldiers? What does the fighting look like here on September 17th, 1862? We are uh, right near the Smoketown Road. It's immediately north of us. It's about 
maybe 30 yards away from us uh, to the north. Right behind me, the ground slopes up and to what we call the Dunker Church Plateau, because from the Dunker Church, there was a plateau of high ground that extended over here. And the Confederates occupied that on the very early morning of September 17th with a battalion of artillery, uh, Stephen D. Lee's battalion of artillery. And that artillery was uh, engaged all morning, firing at federal troops off to the north, three quarters of a mile to a mile away off to the north. It also was subjected to terrific fire from Union batteries on the other side of Antietam Creek. They had these 20 pound Parrot rifles, which had a range of over two miles that could easily hit S.D. Lee's battalion. In fact, you see in this photograph of Knapp's, uh, or Knapp's battery, there's a dead horse in the foreground, which may be from S.D. Lee's battalion because he lost a number of horses. Uh, but there's a lot of movement of troops in this area. S.D. Lee's battalion eventually is going to uh, have to leave this position because the entire Confederate position to the north of us collapsed mm -hmm. during the uh, morning fighting. When the 12th Corps reinforced the 1st Corps, they unhinged the Confederate line and the Confederates are going to retreat back through this area and Union soldiers are actually going to come up and occupy the other side of the Dunker Church Plateau, men of the 12th Corps. They're going to hold that position and get attack, counterattack there by Confederates who come right past the Dunker Church over here. Kershaw's Brigade and Manning's Brigade of Walker's Division. Uh, when you see some of the other photographs that are taken by Alexander Gardner and his team that came here, uh, they were here September 19th and 20th, right after the battle. One of the famous photographs they took was up on top of the plateau and there's a number of bodies of Confederate soldiers up there. And one of the mistakes people often have made over the years in interpreting that is they think that those are artillerymen of S.D. Lee's battalion. They're not. They're infantrymen of Kershaw's brigade or Manning's brigade. And these counterattacks were repulsed by the 12th Corps. And then the Confederates retreat. And then at about noon, uh, that Union division from the 12th Corps, General Green, he crosses the plateau and goes into the woods past the Dunker Church over there. So there's a lot of movement that goes along around in this area that we're standing at. But it really sounds like throughout the course of the battle, the Confederate soldiers caught within this zone, they're caught in a crossfire. You have Union troops coming this way and heavy artillery coming over the top. So it's just a scene of chaos and slaughter, as, as, you, as you say. Yeah, it's, uh, it, this is a terrible position for the Confederates. One of the problems with the Confederates is when they came into position here on the night of September 16th, uh, it's Stonewall Jackson's command. They're going to relieve John Bell Hood's division, which was off to the north of us in the East Woods and in the cornfield. Hood's men hadn't had anything to eat in a long time. So they're going to be relieved. They're very tired as well. They're going to go back into the West Woods. And I don't think the Confederates really had a good opportunity to uh, assess the landscape and the position. So a lot of their troops were very exposed when the fighting begins. So if you were in um, Marcellus Douglas's brigade, which is about uh, maybe about 400 yards to the north of us, or you were in Harry Hayes's Louisiana brigade, all of these Confederate units describe terrific artillery fire that hits them from the north, from the first Corps artillery, but from the east, from the Union yeah. batteries on the other side of it. And, and that just inflicted a lot of casualties. It's also going to demoralize people before you ever get into infantry combat. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we're working with this photograph of Knapp's battery. It's a very famous photograph. It's been interpreted principally by, you know, William Frazanito in his book, Antietam, at Frazanito, a Gettysburg grad. And he, you know, did a lot of frontline research out here, finding the actual spot of the battle. But now you chose this photograph. You wanted to talk about it out here on the battlefield. How do you use it in your book? And what do you think is the greater significance of this photograph when we talk about the Battle of Antietam? Well, the thing that's so unique about this photograph, there's, there's several things. One, you're seeing Union soldiers, combat soldiers, as they look in the field, which there's very few photographs taken of soldiers on a battlefield immediately after a battle. That's pretty rare. You're going to see photographs of casualties generally killed. You don't see photographs of the living, of a living of, of soldiers in a unit on the field. So secondly, Knapp's battery is not in a position that 
Knapp was fighting on. It's not far from where Knapp was during the battle. Knapp was actually uh, north towards the cornfield, uh, about a thousand yards away. But he's on the battlefield where there was a lot of fighting. And if you blow the picture up, if you go to the Library of Congress website, which has a very high resolution image of this, when you blow it way up, you can see the cornfield. You can see David Miller's cornfield in there. And the thing that's interesting about that is one of the oft-told stories of the Battle of Antietam, which is taken from Joseph Hooker's report of the battle, is that he brought his artillery up and he, he bombarded the cornfield because he said the Confederates were in the cornfield. And he says every stalk was cut as closely as you could have done it with a knife. Well, that was just a bunch of bunk. That's, that didn't happen. You can see it in the photograph that the corn's still standing. It's knocked down, a lot of it's trampled and everything like that. But so it shows you that the corn's still standing. You also can see the position that Douglas's brigade occupied. Um, and another great thing is the, the work that was done out here in the last couple of years by the Safe Historic Antietam Foundation and the American Battlefield Trust and the National Park Service. They, they acquired this land where a lot of this, uh, there had been some buildings up here south of the cornfield. Now you look at the photograph of Knapp's battery and you look out here today and it is almost identical. It's amazing. So the, the photograph can help us really understand the landscape like it was during the battle. You see the east woods in it. You can see the north woods in the distance. You see the Smoketown Road right behind the guns. Uh, there's a fence line that shows you where the Smoketown Road is. So there's a lot of uh, very famous landmarks associated with the Battle of Antietam that you can see in this photograph. Yeah, absolutely. yeah I've never really known Joe Hooker to exaggerate very often, but um, <laughs> I think I, I just I, I love the photograph, and I think it usually is interpreted as just that opportunity to see the landscape as it appeared. But I really do appreciate you bringing in the artillerymen too, that these guys actually saw action in this landscape and almost very very uh, very very nearby. But um, I, yeah, it's, it's a great photograph. It's, it's, it's awesome to have you out here, and uh, we'll see you at the um, next virtual source stop. Okay. Hello again and welcome back to the Antietam Battlefield here with Scott Hartwig. We are now at the Sunken Lane and we're going to be talking a little bit about the experience of the 14th Indiana Infantry which attacked the Confederate positions here on September 17th, 1862. We have a couple of selected quotes to talk about some of the traumatic moments from this battle and the ways they affect a combat unit after the fact. And our first quote is from Captain David Beam, who commanded a company of the 14th Indiana. And in a letter to his wife shortly after the battle, he included a, a short footnote at the end of it where he, he wrote, quote, oh, the rush and roar of battle. I wonder if the dreadful sounds will ever get out of my ears, end quote. And now going to William Houghton, another soldier of the 14th Indiana, he wrote, quote, I saw my brave boys fall like sheep led to the slaughter. Bryant was shot through the brain, McCord was shot near the heart, and while the lifeblood was gushing from the wound, he sat up with an almost heavenly smile playing upon his features. He told us he was dying, but to not mind him. Farewell, Captain, he exclaimed as I reached toward him, and he fell forward to the earth. And then one more account from Augustus Van Dyke, who wrote, quote, I escaped unharmed while men were falling all around me. The terrors of battle were beyond imagination. Death from the bullet is ghastly, but to see a man's brains dashed out at your side by a grape shot and another body severed by a screeching cannonball is truly appalling. May I never again see such horrors as I saw that day. So first, Scott, tell us about the experience of the 14th Indiana here on the battle. What is the mechanics of their experience? And then let's talk a little bit about uh, what these traumatic memories do to the men and what they do to their combat effectiveness. Yeah, the 14th Indiana is a part of uh, General William French's division of the 2nd Army Corps. And uh, about mid-morning of the 17th, French's division 
move from the east woods down towards the sunken lane and he mounted an attack, a frontal assault against the sunken lane. The lane is uh, about 50 yards, 40 yards away from us, right over here to the south. And in that part of the lane was the 6th Alabama Infantry. And you can see some monuments close by. These are also monuments to units that were in French's division. It gives us an idea of how short the range was in this fighting. And part of the reason the range was short is the topography. You can't see the lane until you're almost right on top of it. It was one of the advantages of the lane is that the federal soldiers got very close to it. It was also a disadvantage of the lane because when you stand up here on this little hill that we're at where the 14th Indiana eventually came up to, you could get a crossfire down into the lane, which is what these soldiers did, and then they inflicted a lot of casualties on the Confederates. The 14th Indiana, uh, their commander was a, their, their brigade commander was a, uh, their former colonel, Nathan Kimball, and he was a, a tough, uh, aggressive sort of soldier, and his brigade was probably the best brigade in French's division. It was all the veteran units, plus one brand new unit, but the 14th Indiana, the 8th Ohio, these were veteran units that had combat experience. And the 14th, when they came onto this little rise that we're on here, there would have been hundreds of casualties here. They also would have passed hundreds of casualties going to the rear, just to the north of us. I can see the William Roulette farm. And I can see the Samuel Mama farm. The William Roulette farm was an aid station during the battle. And this can give you some feeling for what the medical personnel are dealing with. They're gonna have 2,200 wounded from French and Richardson's divisions in about three hours. So, I mean, people can understand that, that volume of casualties in that short amount of time was overwhelming. So, Roulette's farm was meant to be an aid station because it's pretty close to the fighting, but it actually is gonna serve someone as a field hospital as well. So if you're in the 14th Indiana, when you were coming up here, you're passing a lot of casualties to begin with. And when you get up here, two brigades had already attempted to attack the lane and had taken really heavy losses. And the 14th Indiana is gonna drop down to the ground and you're just gonna blaze away at the Confederates in the lane over here. You're very exposed on this high ground, so you're taking a lot of small arms fire. But as you look to the west uh, and you're following the Park Avenue, which follows kind of the, the route of the sunken lane, uh, you can see some high ground on the other side of the Hagerstown Pike. Well, the Confederates posted artillery over there because that was beyond the range of the 20-pound Parrot rifles on the other side of Antietam Creek. And that artillery is firing at you. So when, I forget which one it was, whether it was Houghton or, uh, or uh, who was the first one, uh, the person before Houghton you read? Uh, well, uh, David Beam. David Beam. One of them talks about a man having his brains dashed out by a, by a shell. That's the artillery fire coming from over there. So you're exposed to artillery fire uh, on this position. You're also exposed to small arms fire. Um, there's casualties all around you. It would have been, the noise would have been deafening. And there's a tremendous amount of smoke as well. So, you know, when we're out here in the battlefield on a day like today, even though the wind is blowing really hard, <laughs> you know, um, we can see everything really clearly. And sometimes when people visit Civil War battlefields, they wonder, why didn't they do this and do that? Why didn't they move over here or see this? And the reason that they don't is one, one of the things about combat uh, is it, it gives you tunnel vision. So you're really kind of very zeroed in on what is the, the, the most dangerous thing to you that you have to deal with. And the second thing about it is in Civil War combat, it's murky, it's smoky and murky, and the noise is, is, is tremendous, and people are shouting and yelling, and men are being hit, and you're trying to help some guys to the rear, and you're trying to direct, if you're an officer, you're trying to direct the fire of your men. So that's kind of the atmosphere in which the 14th Indiana is in. And the thing about the fighting through here is that if you're in the 14th Indiana, your experience might be completely different than 50 yards away, you go up and over this little hill and down into the lower ground. 
you have more cover. You're not being fired at by the artillery. You might be in a better position from the small arms fire. You're not taking as many casualties. Your experience in the battle might be completely different than the guys 50 yards away from you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 5th New Hampshire fought here, you know, in a similar brigade, absolutely different experience. But just like you said, the pandemonium of the 14th Indiana's experience, going through a field hospital, and I'll correct myself, it was Augustus Van Dyke that yep, talked Van about Dyke. that one that was mutilated. Um, it takes a severe traumatic toll on the men of the 14th Indiana. We quoted David Beam, and after the battle, he will go into convalescence, very similar to the Alabama officer we mentioned earlier. He's no longer combat effective. He needs to go into a period of rest and recuperation. There's nothing physically wrong with him, but he loses a bunch of weight. He's working through the memories of the battle here. So thinking about this and thinking about the, you know, we have physical casualties, we have killed and wounded, but we also have traumatic casualties. So throughout your research, have you found that a lot of these units, they're not very combat effective the day after? It doesn't really seem like they can get up and get back after it. So is this a common thing that happens on the, uh, on the Antietam battlefield, like what happened to this Alabama officer and like what happened to David Beam? Yeah, I think it's a common occurrence that uh, many of these soldiers are suffering after the battle. They're doing their duty. Uh, Rufus Dawes, we, we read from Rufus Dawes in our first stop here. Rufus Dawes writes immediately after the battle, he just had this, this intense, intense headache that almost was debilitating to him. But he couldn't allow it to debilitate him. He had to do his duty. So he was doing his duty. The adjutant of the 132nd Pennsylvania Infantry, which was in the same brigade as the 14th Indiana, his name was Fred Hitchcock, and he wrote a really good book called War from the Inside about his experiences in the war. And he says on September the 18th, he and some of the other officers, he said, we literally almost could only crawl around on the ground. We were so physically prostrated and mentally prostrated by the battle. But he said, we weren't allowed to. We had to go and do our duty. We had to go out and, and take care of our men and police the battlefield and do those sorts of things. And I think that uh, someone like Beam, uh, you force yourself to do what has to be done until you've taken care of it. And then you have a, a, a physical and also emotional collapse. And the thing I found with Civil War soldiers is that um, they understood this. It was kind of, they didn't talk about it, but it was understood that if you collapsed psychologically, mentally, and you went to the hospital, that was okay. If you were trying to escape from duty and went to the hospital, that yeah. wasn't okay. But they could tell the difference. Yeah. They knew what people had been exposed to, like a beam, and that you needed to heal. Yeah. You had to heal. Yeah. Uh, it, oh, one other thing that I'd add to this is that um, I found a lot of evidence of soldiers like Beam in the Battle of Antietam who were profoundly psychologically affected by the battle. I think one of the things that helped many of these men is there wasn't any more fighting other than the Battle of Shepherdstown on September 20th. So they, they had this long period before the Battle of Fredericksburg where they were around other comrades who shared the same experience and they could talk about it. And it was a catharsis for these men. It really helped them heal uh, and, and get over the trauma that they'd suffered in Antietam. Absolutely, and that gets into the other scholarship that being around other men who have been through the same experience and having that opportunity to rest and recuperate is so important to becoming an effective combat unit again. And it's just really fascinating stuff out here. And I think it kind of breaks down that stereotype of the stoic Civil War soldier, the, you know, the dramatic hero, that these guys did have a nuanced understanding of manhood and bravery, but also their own physical limits. So, they, oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I... I actually don't see much difference between uh, Civil War soldiers and soldiers of World War II or World War I or Vietnam or Korea or uh, my son was in Iraq and Afghanistan and I, I've known a lot of other people who are in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I don't see these soldiers really as much different from them at all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Scott Hartwig, and we'll see you at our next uh, virtual tour stop.
Hi, it's Pete Carmichael. I'm back at our next stop uh, in the sunken lane. As you all can see, I have been promoted from carrying the signs. I thought it was very gracious of my students to finally give me the microphone here. And uh, we're in the sunken lane, Scott, and it's so cold out here. We should be in the sunken lane at Fredericksburg. Don't you think yeah, that's right, more fitting? Right, yeah. Why is it that the Confederates always got the sunken lane and the Yankees never got it? Any theories? I don't know. I can't think of an example in which the Union Army had a sunken lane, can you? Uh, Shiloh? Yeah, I was going to say, yes. it's kind of, it's not too sunken. Yeah. And in Gaines's Mill, there is a farmer's lane. Yeah. We discuss tough intellectual stuff here yeah, at yeah, CWI. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, one of the things I think would be useful uh, to describe for our audience is the Confederate alignment here in the sunken lane. Could you give us a sense, again, of the firepower that was generated and I suspect you've seen many different accounts as to how the men loaded and fired. Was it was it like an assembly line? Which some people describe that Fredericksburg, that's what the Confederates were doing. So you know, if we could move the camera and look down this lane, again, imagine it jammed with Confederate soldiers. How would you describe what was happening here? Well, it was a, uh, it was a far worse position than the sunken lane at Fredericksburg. The sunken lane at Fredericksburg was a very powerful position. Mm -hmm. This was actually a, a, a vulnerable position. The Confederates had not intended to defend the sunken lane initially because there was no plans to attack it, so they didn't know they needed to defend it. But also, the uh, the um, the doctrine, you would say, of that era, they hadn't yet started thinking in terms of we need to dig in in any position that we're at. And another question is, why did they pick the sunken lane to defend? Well, they picked it because they knew Union troops had turned and were coming in this direction. So they saw French's division approaching. So D.H. Hill, the Confederate division commander in this area, decides we have to defend this position because this blocks them from being able to get into our center. Why is he here and not up on the higher ground there? So again, can we keep the camera up on that high ground? So Scott, you said that this position uh, if you were to look at a map and you were to say, hey, this is a sunken lane, you would think, oh, my God, this is ideal for the Confederates. You pointed out, not as perfect when you're standing on the ground. So this high ground in front of us, the Federals would have been on that, that ridge line, correct? Right. So they would have been firing, actually looking down at us. Right. Yes? Right. Yeah. And, and so can you tell us about, again, some of the advantages uh, that the Federals were able to get here because of the terrain itself? How did they take advantage of it? Well, the initial advantage is, is the Confederates had the advantage because the Union soldiers didn't know they were here. So when they come up over that little ridge, they're about 50 yards away, 40 yards away. And your first volley from the Confederates was just devastating to the Union troops. But once the Union troops figured out the lay of the Confederate position, well, you're standing here, we're standing where the 6th Alabama was on the right of Robert Rhodes's brigade. And you look to your right on that high ground over there, those Union soldiers of I think he's Ben's, division, Ben's moving it right now. So Ben, go for that high ground there. You can see Union there you soldiers on that higher ground could get a crossfire or almost enfilading fire on you. And that's why in Rhodes's brigade, the 6th Alabama is going to suffer the heaviest losses of any regiment in his brigade. So what about federal artillery? Were they ever uh, utilized effectively against this position? Because it seems to me that it would be or could be exposed just like Stephen D. Lee's guns. Well, one of the reasons the Confederates picked the sunken lane to defend and not go up onto the ridge is because if you went on the ridge, you're exposed to the artillery on the other side of Antietam Creek, the heavy 20-pound parrots. When you're here, they can't see you, so they don't know where you are. They're not going to fire at you. And the, the Federals did a very poor job on this part of the battlefield because there was no command and control. The Second Corps commander was way off to the north. Edwin Sumner, and he didn't even know where French and Richardson's divisions were when they first became engaged. So there was, he, he gave them no artillery assets. He had one battery, Tompkins Battery, which was up near where the Park Visitor Center is today. They were shelling this area, but the, the federal artillery played a, a pretty minimal role in this part of the battle. So there's a, a debate amongst historians about the typical sort of field of fire or killing range, right, uh, during Civil War combat. And Earl Hess, who has written extensively about this and has developed uh, some of the ideas of Patty Griffith, argues that in most cases, Civil War combat was usually 50 yards, maybe a little bit more. Um, 
if you have to speak broadly about your findings at Antietam and specifically here, does that conform to what units were usually locked in or engaged at, at that very close range? And is that what helps explain why the casualties here were so extraordinary? It's only, I would say it's only true of the sunken lane battle. Uh, when you look at the fighting around the cornfield, the east woods, the west woods, there are some instances where some of the fighting is that the one side was able to get really close to the other side. But, uh, for example, Rufus Dawes, we talked about him earlier, the engagement that they have with Douglas's Georgia Brigade, about 200 yards. Um, Christian's Brigade, which was one of brigades in Ricketts Division, they engage Ripley's Brigade near the Mama Farm at 400 yards. Now, that's really extreme range. Ripley's Brigade advances up to the cornfield. They engage 12th Corps troops at about 300 yards. So there's a lot of engagements at Antietam. That I, that I find that are 200 yards, 300 yards, 400 yards. This engagement is, is at such short range because the federal soldiers come right on top of the Confederates before they get fired upon and then they drop down behind this, this ridge that kind of dominates the sunken lane. And that made this a battle of much closer range. So in, in my experience in looking at some of these combats, um, the soldiers, even if they didn't really completely understand how to use their weapons, did not like to get as close, that close, because the casualties increased exponentially when you did. So your observations actually sort of then open up the debate again. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah, it's, it's yeah. just what it, I, it tells us. It's almost impossible to generalize. It is. And the examples you've given us, it again speaks to the importance of terrain. Yeah. Right? Again, coming here again, looking at that high ground, the Federals occupied, we can now appreciate how they were able to get so close, as, as you uh, uh, pointed out. One of the things I'm going to talk about before we, we part is a Confederate soldier uh, in the 6th Alabama, Thomas Taylor. He had survived the very hard and brutal fighting in South Mountain. Uh, he is here, and he survives this. To write an account, would you mind holding the yep. microphone? I just want to say about Taylor as well as I think this matters. Uh, Taylor uh, came from a uh, planter family. In fact, uh, his father's wealth in today's terms was more than a million dollars. So this guy has got a lot of money. He is uh, committed to the Confederate cause. He's fighting right here where we're standing. And at the very end of the fight, he decides to flee with a few remaining survivors of his company. And he wrote the following. I could see my brave companions falling on the right and left. Colonel Gordon, it's of course John B. Gordon, we can talk about him at some point, was wounded after our whole company nearly. Lieutenant Perry, Perry was killed. There were about eight or 10 of us left of two companies, and I began to think of leaving. The few of the regiment left had all gone. Our whole company was with three or four exceptions. I hung my head and breathed a prayer to God for my deliverance. I waited a moment, and then I started. I came out safe and unhurt. God be praised. I felt thankful and would have been willing to have fallen on my knees and publicly thanked him for my deliverance. I believe that nothing but the mercy of God saved me. So, Scott, you made an earlier point that you think that there's sort of a universality of the soldier experience. And so I ask you in reading the, or hearing these words. Certainly there's always been men that have been pious and there's certainly been soldiers who have found God once they get into combat. But it seems to me that, is there not some differences in terms of how men came to explain their own survival and in explaining their own survival is what helped them to, to continue the fight and to put themselves into situations like this? Do you, do you see any differences at all, especially when it comes to religious beliefs? Um, they're kind of all over the map right. when you're, when you're uh, talking about a battle like Antietam. That is, uh, it was just a shocking battle right. to these men's systems. And, and, and many of them were trying to grapple with how it was they survived. Right. So when we were reading uh, from Van Dyke right. and Beam right. and Houghton, um, who were they writing to? Right. Who were they writing to? Were they writing to some army buddy? They weren't writing to their army buddy. They were writing to their wife or their mother. And then they're talking about men getting shot in the heart and blood streaming out of them and their brains being dashed. Why are they doing that? Why are they, why are they writing these sorts of things? Well, 
I sometimes think it wasn't necessarily for their wife or their mother. It was for them. It was for them. It, that's So when Thomas Taylor um, gets out of this, he doesn't know how to account for why I'm alive. That's right. That's right. So the only way I can be alive is because God wants me to be alive. Right. Because I believe in God. I believe God uh, directs a lot of things, even though his experience in this lane had to remind him that combat is so random. Well, you get right to the point of attention for for Taylor and for other men who want to believe that there is some purpose, some meaning, some order, and that God's responsible for it. But Taylor, on the one hand, can say, I was preserved. But on the one hand, can he explain why the men beside him, many of those men, I should add, who were cousins and who were relatives, who fell as well? Why did God let them die? So they're as you point out, right. there's a certain confusion that takes hold. Let's end really quickly with Cameron. We'll bring you into the fray. Could you bring the painting actually from Hope, who was a Union soldier who I don't think saw combat here at, at Antietam, did he? He was certainly he was here. But the point is, is that this painting, uh, done obviously long after the war, I just want people to take this in, and we'll end by reminding ourselves that Civil War soldiers, as they try to express and explain what happened to them. They used words, and we know that often in their post-war memoirs, like John B. Gordon, it was very romantic and it was very heroic. And we also know that in some paintings, even done by soldiers, the same heroism comes through. But take a close look at this to remind us that the so-called dark war that the soldiers or the veterans tried to hide from us, now, I think that's bunk. I think they put two different versions, and probably more than two different versions, but they were the spectrum from heroism to this dark side, to this realism. And that is, of course, extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. It captures this scene directly behind Cameron. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much. And our next stop will be at, I'm not sure. I don't know, Scott, I thought you knew. Uh, You're the tour guide. We're going down, down towards Burnside's we're, Bridge. We're making our way to Burnside's Bridge. All right, we'll see you all then. Thanks so much. All right, good afternoon. We are back uh, after lunch. We had Panera. What did you have, Scott? What kind of sandwich? Uh, uh, Napa almond chicken salad <laughs> Napa sandwich. Almond. Napa almond. Sounds very hearty for the battlefield. Oh. I had a blueberry and tangerine orange salad. I and, and did you see that? And this frigid weather, that's yeah, yeah that's good, not good battlefield choice. tromping good food choice. at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're looking at, at, uh, at Antietam Creek, which... Uh, you know, we've been talking about whether the creek was fordable, and we've got two young men here. I think we should, let's see how high it is, boys. What do you think? Come on. I have no leverage on them now, right? They're not in my classes two weeks. Now, if they were first-year students, they'd be jumping in, regardless right, of that. Yeah. Now, there have been folks that have given tours. I'm being serious. And, like, canoes. Have you done that down the Antietam I've Creek? I've not, not done that. Any I, have, just, I have a couple of kayaks, but I haven't done Antietam Creek. Any desire to do that? No. A kayak down oh, the creek. With a group. I think we should do that for CWI. Sure. What about inner tubes? Uh, Not that. Like, we can get a case of beer. You know how popular yeah, that would be at CWI? We can make some serious money doing it's that, not man. A, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> it is not. Well, we. I think one of us would have to get certified for lifeguard. Yeah. At least one of us. Yeah. Right. That would be a situation. Yeah. Definitely. Well, as we look across Antietam Creek at the heights that um, Tombs is... Georgians occupied. I'd like for you to first, uh, Scott, tell us a little bit about the position that they held. And I'd also like for you to just quickly reflect upon the situation for R.E. Lee. We're on obviously the far Confederate right flank here at Burnside's Bridge. So yes, if you could talk, describe that hillside and then tell us about what's going on uh, at high command in the Army in Northern Virginia. Well, this is the, uh, the only crossing of Antietam Creek that Lee is going to directly defend. And he's going to directly defend it because he can. 
uh, if you go to the middle bridge and you go to the upper bridge, those positions were not really defendable by Lee because the Federals could bring artillery to bear or whatever to dominate those positions. They can't do that here. He can defend directly against it. It's got really high bluffs on the on the west side of the creek, so he's going to defend this bridge. It also leads to his right flank, which he is very wary about because um, – this is the easiest access that the Federals would have to get behind him and on his only route of escape, and that is back to Bottler's Ford on the Potomac River, which is about three miles away. Um, so Lee, Lee is very wary about that. Uh, nevertheless, on the morning of the 17th, because of the tremendous pressure that's applied to him on his left flank, he withdraws the most substantial force that he has on his right flank, which was John Walker's division, which is about 3,200 men, he sends them to the left flank. What that's going to leave here is to defend the approaches from the middle bridge and the lower bridge is David R. Jones's division. And Jones has um, six brigades, one of which gets attached and sent up to uh, the, the fighting in the West Woods, G.T. Anderson's brigade. But all of his brigades are very, very small. They're uh, like Garnett's Brigade, about 200 men. How many did Toombs have up here? Toombs is, Toombs is one of the bigger brigades, even though he only has two regiments on the field when the battle begins. And while Toombs is the commander of the brigade, and we often say Toombs Georgians are over here and right. Toombs is defending, it gives you the impression that Robert Toombs is the one making all the tactical decisions. And that actually isn't the case. He is... And that's uh, a good thing, probably, for the it, Confederacy. Right. It is. Um, another fire-eating Southern politician, uh, Henry Benning, is he is a very proficient tactician. And Benning is actually the person who's responsible for deploying the 15th, or the, excuse me, the 2nd and the 20th Georgia uh, along these bluffs. And he does a really good job of hiding his men, having his men build cover, and being in position to completely dominate the bridge with fire, but also the ground south of the bridge and north of the bridge. So you can't jump into Antietam Creek and not have anybody shoot at you. You're gonna get fired at. Um, he also has uh, a mixture of rifles and muskets in these two regiments. And what that's going to mean is you have to let the enemy get pretty close to you before you're going to start to fire at him because you don't want to give away your position, number one. You don't want to waste ammunition because these men are probably carrying about 60 rounds of ammo. So if you can fire two rounds a, a minute, you can only be in action 30 minutes. And you may need to be in action longer than that. So people shouldn't imagine the fighting down here is the Confederates are just blazing away as fast as they can. The Confederates did a very good job of fire discipline, and they did a very good job of picking targets and, um, and not wasting ammunition. Mm -hmm. So, so Toombs' brigade is far forward of the rest of the division because— And there's no artillery. Any he does have artillery support. They have some batteries, and today you can't really see it because— as you look up the creek, right. there's all these woods over here. But there was a battery of the Washington artillery that could fire right down into this approaches right. to the bridge. This is the uh, lower bridge road, which today... So before we talk about the storming of the bridge itself, what you've just described on the Confederate right flank, lying paper thin, little artillery, and many point to that as that there was this great opportunity, uh, one that was lost by George B. McClellan. What's sort of your quick response to those who say, you know, not until maybe the last year of the war did an officer commanding the Army of the Potomac uh, presented with an opportunity in which a victory of annihilation was within reach? Uh, I don't think that McClellan could have destroyed Lee's army uh, here, here at Antietam. And I say that because 
uh, even he could have done some things in this battle. He could have made some decisions in this battle, uh, particularly the the commitment of the Sixth Army Corps, which was his, his principal reserve, and he sent them to the right rather than to the center or to his left, which might have made a really significant difference. But I think Lee's army was good enough. Lee was a good enough general, and there's enough terrain between here and Butler's Ford that Lee, what Lee would have done is he would have fought a holding action and fallen back from Sharpsburg into other defensive ground. And he would have been able to hold the federal off, army off for the rest of the day. He would have retreated not on the uh, night of the, uh, the 18th, he would have retreated on the night of the 17th. So McClellan might have been able to uh, make him retreat sooner than he did. I don't think McClellan was gonna destroy his army here. And again, what you described in terms of the Confederate defense, and again, thinly held, it still is pretty amazing how they were able to hold off federal attackers. And again, there's a lot of controversy about that, and I think we need to save a few things for your book, but that's another perception of this place where we're standing, that first, that Burnside had some preoccupation with bridges, as he would reveal at Fredericksburg and would refuse to ford the Rappahannock River, and so that we, there's a foreshadowing of that here at, at Antietam. So let's deal with that very quickly, and then we'll move to the storming of the bridge. For those who say the lost opportunity uh, in, in which Burnside's responsible for, it is again this, for whatever reason, a failure or refusal to be a little creative, take a chance, ford a creek, instead of waiting to storm the bridge. What's your response to people who say that? Uh, he couldn't have just forded the creek. That just wasn't possible. Um, not without resistance. It, it would He would have had to plan that operation. Uh, Burnside's story is actually far more complex than the simplistic story that we generally get of a dunderhead general who can't figure out any other way to get across the creek. He sees the bridge. He's got to capture the bridge. He just tries to make frontal assaults against the bridge. And, you know, that's why they call it Burnside's Bridge. It's not because it's in, it's in honor of Burnside's. It's, it's, it's condemning his, his generalship here. Um, Burnside's, all of Burnside's initiative was squelched by McClellan, for one thing. Uh, McClellan sent his army engineers out to determine where the fords were. He determined where every one of the Ninth Corps divisions were to be placed. That was not Burnside who chose that. That was McClellan's headquarters who did that. So he, McClellan just kind of superseded Burnside's ability to command the Ninth Corps. And uh, consequently, when the initiative was discouraged, you know, Burnside isn't going to be, he didn't come down here and reconnoiter. Uh, he also had some officers who uh, didn't serve him all that well, for one thing. The initial plan to take the bridge was for the 11th Connecticut Infantry to come up over this, this little hill right uh, in front of us here. And their job was to engage the Confederates defending the bridge and draw their fire. So they got the most dangerous job. And then Colonel George Crook's Ohio Brigade was to storm the bridge while the Ohio and, or the, while the Connecticut soldiers drew the fire of the Confederates. George Crook didn't even know where the bridge was. So he'd done no reconnaissance whatsoever. He didn't even really know where the creek was because he, he hadn't done any sort of uh, preparatory work before he might be engaged. And for a brigade commander, that's his job. I mean, he may not even uh, be involved in an attack on the 17th, in the morning of the 17th, but he had to be prepared for it. He wasn't prepared for it. So the attack kind of fell apart. So there's one example of, you know, Burnside's not responsible for George Crook not doing his job. Uh, the plan on paper wasn't a bad plan the first effort to take the bridge. And Burnside also realizes that he has to get the bridge. You know, he's got to take the bridge. But he also sent out a flanking force under General Rodman, his whole division. They were to cross at Snavely's Ford. What they were told was Snavely's Ford wasn't Snavely's Ford, so they ended up having to march almost a mile to find the Ford. That took a lot of time to do that. Uh, he did cross uh, uh, Scammon's brigade of um, the Ohio Division. They did cross at the Ford uh, about 900, 1,000 yards below Burnside's Bridge. Some of Crook's men crossed at a Ford. They found the Ford farther up from the bridge. They crossed that Ford. So it wasn't as if the Ninth Corps wasn't trying to get across the creek and find other places besides the bridge but they also needed to get the bridge quickly 
because the only way you can get artillery across and ammunition across, you have to have the bridge. Uh, this is a place that uh, is actually very deceiving. People come here and they reach uh, fairly simplistic uh, conclusions about why Burnside did what he did or what he did not do. So let's now turn very quickly to the storming of the bridge, and we're going to look at the print or drawing uh, that Ben is holding up with this Georgia hat on. You can just see it. Go dogs. Uh, Ben's going to go to UGA next year for graduate school. So as you look at this, Scott, could you just again very quickly tell us uh, how, what does this depict, first of all? And what would you give it in terms of its accuracy uh, in capturing that moment uh, when the Federals stormed uh, the bridge? It seems to be pretty, it, it does seem to be fairly accurate uh, about the flags you see at the top of the hill. That's uh, Toombs, Toombs Brigade up there. Uh, I never have read a single account from any Union soldier who saw a single Confederate flag. And the other thing about the Confederates that Union soldiers all mention is they couldn't see them. So you're not putting flags up like that to be seen. And also, federal artillery was shelling that position, so you don't want to draw attention to where you are on the hill. And they were in mines, right? They were in, they were in. You can see those, the craters. There were some, some pits. They even, uh, they even piled fence rails to create protection. Um, they had really good cover. And, and even though there wasn't a lot of underbrush on the slope of the hill, there was enough trees. Some of the guys were up in the trees as well. Uh, but, um, and there's also almost no casualties. And right near where we're standing, there's a wayside exhibit that shows a soldier standing right near where we're standing right now. And you can see all these graves of men of the 51st Pennsylvania. So there were a number of casualties along here. Um, this is depicting the final assault on the bridge. The bridge was assaulted. I mentioned a little bit earlier about the attack of the 11th Connecticut and, and Crook's Brigade that failed. They tried another uh, effort to come up the lower bridge road with two regiments, the, uh, the uh, 2nd Maryland and the 6th New Hampshire. And the idea in that attack was, well, we'll run really fast up the road and we'll cross over the bridge and we'll, we'll provide you covering fire by troops that are up here on the hill behind you. That was the idea of that attack. That attack didn't work. So then they decided we'll try a third attack and we're going to do something a little bit differently this time. We're going, to, we're going to attack from over this hill right behind us, and we're going to use two veteran units, the 51st Pennsylvania and the 51st New York, and they would use the 21st Massachusetts to provide covering fire, and they arranged better artillery support this time. So in this particular instance, um, what happened was when the regiments rushed the bridge, the fire was so heavy upon them, uh, the commander of the 51st Pennsylvania, Colonel John Hartram, what he wanted to do was just try and rush right over the bridge. And he said his men just broke for this stone wall right here and got behind this wall because the fire upon them was so accurate and so many men had been hit. They could get cover here and then they started to fire. It turned out that um, it may have been the best thing that they could do because what happens is once they get here and they start firing, they start to gain a little bit of fire superiority because you have the 51st Pennsylvania. On the other side of the bridge along the fence line was the 51st New York, and farther down from them was the 21st Massachusetts, and artillery's firing over your head, right? So what happened with the Confederates over here is they're towards the end of their ammunition to begin with. They've taken some casualties, but now they're really getting some effective fire. And that is when Benning decided based upon the low ammunition, the volume of fire that they were receiving, and he had received word that federal troops had forded the creek below his position. So he's gonna get out flank. He decides to retreat. So then he orders a retreat. And about the time he orders a retreat, that's when the 51st New York and the 51st Pennsylvania are gonna to rush towards the bridge, rush over the bridge. Uh, some of the men actually went into the creek because uh, there's an account that I have of a soldier from the 51st Pennsylvania. He was just below the bridge, and he watched one of the guys in his company fording the creek and shot a Confederate out of a tree and then continued on across. So we know that some men did ford the creek at this point. And one of the oddest things that I think I found in the whole battle of uh, the lower bridge is the fighting has almost subsided, right? And they found two Confederates 
under the bridge cooking some food. I don't know where they came from. They didn't identify what units they were from, but they must have been from Tombs Command. But sometimes we think that everybody is 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 completely committed to the fight and and we forget that human needs when people are like really super hungry they don't care about some of the other stuff that's going on so these guys get captured um and it's uh so it was a really really hard fight i mean the, the federals took about 500 casualties here and uh tombs's brigade under Benning's leadership here, uh, they did their job. I mean, two regiments, uh, pretty small regiments to begin with, and uh, they just, they were well positioned, and they made the Federals spend a couple of hours trying to take the bridge. Great. Well, Scott, thank you so much for that. We will continue our discussion at our next tour stop, where we will be looking at the advance of Burnside's men uh, against the paper-thin Confederate right flank. Thanks. All right, welcome back to another stop on our Antietam virtual tour. We're going to be talking about the advance of the 89th New York, but Scott, before we get into that, can you kind of orient uh, our audience to where we are in the battlefield? Because this is a spot I've never been to before, so I'm sure this is going to be a new location for a lot of people tuning in today as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's on what the National Park Service calls the last attack trail. I mean, the, the Antietam National Battlefield has a tremendous trail system. You could actually hike from the northern end of the battlefield at the far southern end and never have to be on the roads in the park. They, they have all these trails all over the place. And this, this trail follows the last attack of the 9th Corps in the Battle of Antietam and the counterattack by AP Hill's division, which came up from Harper's Ferry. We are uh, about, I don't know, 1,000 yards, 1,200 yards from Burnside's Bridge. And when you come up from Burnside's Bridge, uh, the first ridge line that you come to is the one we're standing on right now. And it was a natural point for the Federals to place artillery and also to conceal their infantry that were going to make the attack. Now, if you look behind us, uh, in the distance up on the hill, I can see the monument to the 9th New York Infantry. They are in the same brigade as the 89th New York. And the 9th New York makes probably the farthest advance in this assault up towards the Harpers Ferry Road, which runs along that high ground that you can see. And that high ground is what the Confederates have to hold on to. Because if the Federals can capture that, and then they can get into Sharpsburg, they could cut off the retreat of the Confederate Army towards Shepherdstown. So that is the point. Uh, we talked about Tombs Georgians down at Burnside's Bridge. Well, when they retreat, the next line of defense is up along that ridge line and just down below the ridge line. And one of the things that prevented the Federals, so one of the criticisms of Burnside is that why did Burnside just cross the, the bridge and then get his guys up here and just charge? Well, you couldn't charge because Confederate artillery commanded all this ground out in front of you. So before you can send your infantry out there, you had to get artillery over here, like Lieutenant Clark's battery right here, and they have to engage the Confederate batteries and suppress that fire so the infantry can make the assault. So um, when the 9th Corps is going to attack, they're going to attack in the direction that you see the monument over here. They have no cavalry to scout on their left flank. So they don't do any reconnaissance in that area. But they are advised by a signal station on the other side of Antietam Creek that no Confederate troops are seen off in that direction. So that's very significant because if you were Jacob Cox, who was the tactical commander of the 9th Corps, you're not worried about a big Confederate force coming in on your left flank. Your orientation of attack is going to be this way. So we're going to talk about a primary source here from the Union News in New York. It's a newspaper. It's a letter from William Powers to his children, uh, written on September 23rd, 1862. And there's just a brief passage from it we're going to read and discuss. 
So it's towards the end of his letter. He writes, for me to picture to you, the scene of a battlefield is impossible. Men in the agonies of death pleading for water and for assistance is enough to melt the stoutest heart. Although they were our enemies and striving their very best to kill and conquer us, yet the tear must drop to behold their dying agonies and hear them plead for mercy. May God grant that I... May God grant that I may never behold such a scene again. You can imagine something of their loss. As we left on the first battlefield, 20 men to bury their den, 20 men to bury their dead, and it is now six days since the battle was fought here, and there is hundreds of rebels that is not yet buried, although they are working night and day to accomplish the work. I think that puts into perspective just how jarring some of the casualty numbers uh, there are. So can you tell us what you make of this source and, and what it kind of means to you for your work? Well, it's interesting that um, I think he's writing to his wife and his wife shares his letter that he wrote to her with the newspaper because she and maybe he think it's important that the people at home realize that this is what the war is really like. So he's telling her, like, this is this is what I'm seeing out here. And she's wanting to make sure the community knows that this is what he's seeing. I find this really interesting because, uh, you know, when I was growing up and I was a kid, it was during the Vietnam War, and uh, during the Vietnam War, you never saw anything like that in a newspaper, nothing like that. You would see news reports on uh, television, but that was the closest that you really got to the war. This this tells the war like it is. And I think sometimes we have a, a an idea that in the Civil War it was different in that era they tried to glorify everything and i'm like no they didn't not in the newspapers in the newspapers they were incredibly frank i mean brutally frank about what was really going on and the other thing he's describing there is that um you know this is a, a considered a union victory there's nothing in there about boy we really whipped the rebs this time we won the battle big you know we, this was a big victory for us Instead, it's it's a, uh, and I think his this letter is more typical of letters you see after Antietam, because I noticed very few Confederates and very few federal soldiers mention whether they won the battle. Most of them say it was just really a hard-fought battle. They, they thought it was kind of a drawn battle, but they're also just glad to be alive, and they're also shocked by the, the carnage of the battle, because... We sometimes, when we view the Civil War, we look at it from the perspective of, oh, they were all big, bloody battles. So these guys are coming from the perspective of, we don't anticipate there's going to be these gigantic, bloody battles like this. And now we're having them. Where is this going to go? How does this end? It's really jarring, I think, for these, these soldiers. so Because they don't know how it ends yet. This is September of 1862. Yeah, no, and I, I think the, the one thing as I read this that was jarring to me is it took more more than six days working day and night to bury, and it speaks to the, we Ben's letters earlier today talking about the trauma of the battlefield. There is a physical scarring of the landscape that needs to be repaired, and there's a significant number of casualties that are left here at Antietam. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about that process of really the army having to kind of stay here almost, uh, portions of it at least, to take care of the wounded and the dead before heading um, away. Yeah, they. Um, uh, there's a lot of really, really good accounts of soldiers on burial details. Um, one that comes to mind from where we're standing right here, because I'm thinking about it, uh, just a little ways from us is the monument to the 16th Connecticut Infantry. And their adjutant, his name was John Burnham, he wrote a really good letter uh, about the battle uh, right after the battle in, in early October. But he also wrote another account about uh, his job on the 19th of September after it was determined the Confederates had retreated. He takes a detail of men from his regiment. His regiment had, had uh, they were three weeks from home, they had no drill, no training, and they got hit in the flank by AP Hill's counterattack and routed from the field. They took really heavy losses. And uh, he describes going into the cornfield. It was a big 40-acre cornfield over here. He's going into the cornfield and gathering up the dead of the regiment. And what a incredibly somber event this was for them because these were these were all you know just 
a few days before, these were their friends. They were full of life. They were laughing and joking and everything. And now they're here, dead bodies. Um, but he is really super specific about where he buried everyone, how he identified everyone, because he wanted to make sure that if families wanted to come and take the body from the battlefield and bring it home, that they would be able to do that. Um, it's also important for people to know that this is not an era in which soldiers have dog tags. It's not an era in which the, the army does do the burials on the battlefield, but it's not an era in which you're going to immediately establish a cemetery and you're going to dispose of the dead in a proper way like, you know, they would do in, even in battles in the Pacific in World War II. Um, so it's a... Um, it's a crude process sometimes. Like if you're a Union soldier and you were burying the Confederates over here, you're not going to try to identify them. You're just going to dig ditches in the ground. You're going to put them in there and you might put a marker that says five Confederate bodies or five Rebs or something like that. Um, and then it's going to take someone from their side who one day is going to be able to come back here and remove those bodies to a cemetery. So it was a really crude and very sad process that, that occurred. I think that gives a really nice bit of perspective to the photos of Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner that we look at here of what comes after those photographs that these are men who need to be interred and in some cases will never be identified. Yeah. Um, and so we're actually going to head over for our final stop to Antietam National Cemetery. Scott, we'll see you there and uh, we'll have everyone else tuning in. Hey, Jill, you can go ahead and stop sharing the screen. Thank you. All right. Make sure we're all here. Back on. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to scoot over? Sure. Pete? Okay, then Ashley, you'll read some of the questions. Yeah. I'm can just you see them all? Hand myself here. All right, there we go. Yeah. Thank you guys. And just a, a quick apology. We actually, we did film a stop in the National Cemetery. Uh, we really liked that stop. It was a good conclusion to wrap all this up and, and ask some more provocative questions. And unfortunately the sound did not come on at all during that stop. So we, we lost it. Um, so sorry about that, but maybe we can talk about some of the themes that we are discussing at the cemetery during the Q and A. Uh, but we'll we'll start right into the the Q and A. Yeah, with right the questions. Now. Before I, as you're looking at that, Ashley, just very quickly to show you Scott's uh, the first of two volumes published by Johns Hopkins Press, uh, covering the campaign uh, leading up to the battle. And just so I don't think well, we probably did talk about it in the video. Manuscript is finished. You're in the the fun process of revising. That's right. really. We get to wrestle with your pros, right? right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of wrestling. <laughs> lots of wrestling. Lots of wrestling. Yeah, yes, and is. so uh, you're hoping that you'll be able to send it off to the press. And can we give us a, a rough, rough guess of when it might be published? If I work really hard, uh, maybe by September, I can have it off to the press. And then it takes about a year. Yes, uh, that's right. After that. That's right. And are we looking at another 700 page volume? It's it's in the same ballpark. It might be slightly shorter than that, but it's in the same ballpark. Yeah, good. It's 25 Fantastic. chapters. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. All right. So we have lots of questions. We'll let Ashley sort of go right. through the, the so mix here. We have uh, a few just kind of clarifying questions to start off with. We're going to go back to the, the top. We'll start off with some of the questions from the second stop there at the cornfield about the six Wisconsin. Uh, being in the Iron Brigade. Yes, they were in the Iron Brigade. Um, what was the weather like, Scott, in September of 1862? Uh, it was kind of typical September weather. It uh, The night before the battle, the uh, late night, September 16th, early September 17th, they had a drizzly rain. So the, the, when the battle began, it was still slightly hazy, foggy in certain areas. And then the rain had stopped by the time the battle began at about 530. And then uh, gradually the uh, 
the fog burned off and the haze burned off and the sun came out and uh, it got fairly warm by the afternoon on, on, on the 17th. So it was actually uh, fairly decent weather on the day of the battle. They didn't have snow flurries like we did. Uh, it, it was a lot, it was a lot warmer than the day we were there. Yeah. <laughs> I can't seem to let that go. Yeah. That's yeah. a problem. It's very memorable. <laughs> we weren't expecting it. <laughs> no, <laughs> That's we weren't. The thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Heather just said that it's maybe, or Jill said it's a little hard to hear. So I guess oh, we'll try okay. to Okay, here we go. Um, Here's I guess the they can hear you the best. So maybe if we just center it. There we go. More. Well, um, yeah, perfect. Um, so... Another question about the 6th Wisconsin. Where else did they fight? We know they fought, of course, at Gettysburg. Uh, where else did they fight, Scott? The uh, 6th Wisconsin was in all the major battles of the Army of the Potomac, except the Peninsula Campaign. They, they did not participate in that. They were actually with Irwin McDowell's Corps. So they were in Northern Virginia. They were in the 2nd Manassas Campaign. Uh, the first big battle was what's called Bronner's Farm, which was on August 28th, right before Second Manassas, they fought at South Mountain, they fought at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg was a really big battle. Iron Brigade lost 1,200 men at Gettysburg. And then there were all the battles of um, the Overland campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get late in, uh, you get into the Petersburg campaign, then um, some of the regiments did not uh, re-enlist as veteran volunteers. They didn't get enough uh, men who re-enlisted. So the brigade kind of took on a different, um, form because they started attaching other regiments to it. So it kind of lost its Western feel and uh, or Western identity. Um, but some of the units, the 6th Wisconsin was one of them. They went through the entire war. Yeah, one of those, yeah, long, long-term, hard beaten uh, regiments. Yeah. Um, question about the, the shell, actually a couple of questions that we had about the shell image. Uh, one in relation to the events that uh, he saw, did Shell make the sketches? Um, has the battlefield terrain changed from the original battle till today? Is that the one? Uh, no, this one about the, oh. the Shell. Um, in relation to the events that he did. Um, supposedly Shell made the sketches at the time. So he he was traveling the battlefield. Well, that's what Shell says. I mean, he wrote an account of his experience in, in the battle. And um, he probably, what he probably did is he probably took very rough sketches and made notes of those sketches when he went through these areas, like the East Woods. And then when he um, got back to his tent or he got to his studio or wherever he did this, he fleshed the sketches out so that he gave more detail to those sketches. And he could use his notes to, to flesh the sketches out. I can't imagine he made a sketch that detail that you see in some of his on the battlefield at that time. Uh, for one thing, it was too dangerous to do anything like that. You had to, uh, you probably had to do it a pretty rough sketch. Yeah. Um, and then this, the follow-up question on that. Um... Does Shell use his visual material as evidence when he writes? Yes, I believe he did. I mean, that's how we know uh, some of the um, things that we're seeing in that sketch that we uh, we had in the one video that was in the East Woods. That's how we know that the one fellow was the, I think he was the brother or the son. I think it was his father actually at his feet. The one Confederate soldier you see who's, who's sitting down. That's how we know those details is that Shell wrote them and uh, recorded them. And um, I think his account of Antietam um, it may be on there's a there's a really good website called the Battle of Antietam on the web uh, by Brian Downey and uh, I think he may have Shell's account on there but I think you can find it online so uh, you can you could search for that and then that fleshes out some of the details. Um, always a good question about how the terrain has changed since the time of the battle, which I think whenever you take a tour group out on any battlefield, you have to explain what are the key terrain features, what did it look, look like then versus what it looks like now, how accurate is the current uh, representation of the battlefield compared to 1862? Yeah, there's actually at Antietam, there's a lot of changes. The uh, All of the woodlots that were important in the battle of Northwoods, Eastwoods, Westwoods, all the woodlots were cut down. Uh, after the war, well, a while after the war. So the, 
the National Park Service today, if you go down to Antietam and visit it, you'll see that they've replanted the Northwoods. So within probably 15, 20 years, that'll be mature trees and you'll have a really good feeling for what that looked like at the time of the battle. The Eastwoods was uh, all cut down, then that became privately owned. And uh, they just recently, they've been able to acquire, I think all the property in there or most of it that was in there to the Civil War Trust. And um, they are replanting a lot of the Eastwoods as well. The other thing about the Eastwoods is um, William Robbins, who was the uh, a captain in the 4th Alabama, and he ended up commanding the regiment after the, the, uh, the major was wounded. Um, he wrote about all these boulders that, that the men took cover behind in, in the Eastwoods. Well, if you go to that area where the 4th Alabama was and the 5th Texas and the 21st Georgia, there's almost no boulders in there. So my, I don't know this, I'm, I, I'm just speculating here that uh, one of the landowners, he removed the boulders at some point because they, maybe they were uh, um, you know, turning that land into uh, their cultivated ground. So they, they removed the boulders. So there, there's another example. Um, the area where Sedgwick's division fought one of the most significant fights in the morning of, September, of the 17th, uh, today has the uh, Route 65 runs right through the middle of the battlefield. So it's right in the middle, right on the front line, literally, of Sedgwick's division where the Alfred Poffenberger farm was. Um, it's really unfortunate that they located that. I mean, it was really hard to find a place to put that road that didn't go right through the middle of the battlefield, but it went right through a really critical part of the battlefield there. And the uh, Park Service is also replanting uh, parts of the Westwoods as well. So they, they've done a really good job down there of trying to rehabilitate the landscape in Antietam. Uh, and they've had a challenge in that because Antietam was not developed the way Gettysburg was. At Gettysburg, there was an effort to acquire the land of the battlefield at Antietam. They acquired rights of way through uh, through battlefield areas so they could create avenues. They didn't own the land. And that allowed all sorts of changes to take place and um, private, private buildings to be built. And, um, you know, recently the Civil War Trust purchased um, a farm that was located just south of the cornfield. And that area, it's a plateau, I call it like the, the cornfield plateau, which is immediately south of the cornfield. That saw some of the heaviest fighting of the battle. Everybody thinks everybody was fighting all in the cornfield the whole time, but there was a tremendous amount of fighting in that area south of the cornfield. Rufus Dawes, at his account, that's where he's at. Well, you couldn't interpret it for a long time because there was this uh, house there and a barn and uh, the, the trust bought that, I think about two or three years ago. And um, Save Historic Antietam helped them with, uh, re, you know, rehabilitating the landscape. They removed the buildings and it just transformed how you see the Battle of Antietam. So we're still seeing changes to Antietam. Um, and I think we'll see more as we move on, as the park is able to, um, and with the help of organizations like uh, Shafe and uh, the Civil War Trust is able to, uh, purchase more property that they don't have right now. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's one of the, the most complete battlefields, it seems like, or the largest swath of contiguous battlefield um, that, that exists. Um, so it's a really a special place, especially compared to places like Richmond, you know, where I used to work. It's just postage stamps that have gotten bigger over yeah. time, which has been great, but you don't have that huge swath of, of battlefield that yeah. you can walk from start to finish. Uh, yeah, and, and see it in an entirely different. Yeah, way. and it's taken a lot of players to yeah. get them to where they are, uh, because it it's a it's a complicated story, yeah. and uh, you know there's a lot of people who are unsung heroes in uh, preserving land at Antietam that um, you know we don't hear about them every day, but we really appreciate what they've done right. in providing this landscape that we can now explore, which. You know, the, uh, one of the great things while well, Ashley was telling me about how she hiked the trails, they have a trail system in Antietam. You can hike from the northern end of the battlefield all the way to the very southern end of the battlefield and, and never be on park roads. You're, you're taking this trail system that Keith Snyder, the chief of interpretation in Antietam is really kind of the person who uh, uh, spearheaded that, that effort. And uh, you cannot understand Antietam any better than taking that 
that trip. I mean, it's just a fantastic resource, but you couldn't have done that had sure. these people over the years not been able to acquire this land uh, sure. outside of the rights of way. So, right. And yeah. we were talking on, on Friday night with Carol Reardon about uh, her book on Pickett's Charge and about the need to walk Pickett's Charge in order to understand the undulations yeah. and the, the safe spots and the non not so safe spots. But I found when I when I did walk the entire trail um, a few weeks ago, oh my gosh, I mean, Antietam, the terrain is yeah. so much different than it is at Gettysburg that walking that full trail system, you get to see parts that were adjacent to the battlefield, or at least the, the core battlefield, you get to experience the core battlefield where the heaviest fighting took place. And if you take two steps in any direction, it seems like on this battlefield, you see it from a different angle, which right. again, changes the perspective of an individual soldier, you know, in a straight line, they're each going to experience the battle in a very different way. Right. Yeah. If you see it from the road, it's, it's, it's not the way, of course, they were seeing it during the battle. So when you're on these trails, it helps you understand why unit A couldn't see unit B right. and general so-and-so didn't know what was going on on the other side of this hill. But when you're driving around on a road, you might not be able to see that. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, should we get on and look for sure. more questions? Sure, just... The CNO towpath question, Scott, was it was the towpath uh, there in 1862 and did AP Hill use it when he was coming in from Harper's Ferry? Yes, the CNO canal was there. It had actually been cut and drained. And uh, the Burdan sharpshooters during the Battle of Shepherdstown and also some other uh, regular line infantry of the Fifth Corps used it for cover uh, when they were firing on the Confederates on the other side of the Potomac. But the, they had to build a temporary bridge over the canal when AP Hill came up and when the Confederates retreated. And um, that, that, was, uh, that was kind of a choke point because you had to get over the canal and then you had to get over the Bottler's Ford um, in the Potomac, which um, wasn't entirely easy to find. You kind of had to know where the Ford was. <clears throat> I'm moving I'm just, yeah um was there ever a window of opportunity in which burnside's bridge was mainly uncovered and open for a quick union crossing no um the confederates uh identified the bridge as a possible crossing point before the union army ever got there and uh they assigned uh, Tombs Brigade to defend the bridge because they, like I said in the video, that was the only bridge that they could directly defend because they they couldn't put they did they did have skirmishers close to the middle bridge and they had cavalry scouts watching the upper bridge but they didn't try to defend those those places they did defend the lower bridge. The other reason why they defended that, besides the fact that they could defend it, was that was the shortest route towards Lee's right flank and rear and mm -hmm. his only escape route across the Potomac River, which was at Bottler's Ford. Yeah. So Lee really had to be careful about not letting the enemy get across uh, both Burnside's Bridge or Snavely's Ford, which is a mile below it on Antietam Creek. He had to watch those very carefully and defend that, that position. Yeah. Let's see. Hi, everyone. You want to do this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, With... Can we do it? Sure. So, hi, everyone. This question is for Scott Hartwig. With all the horrific combat that Dawes and the 6th West Council was involved in, did Dawes consider the combat at Antietam as the most horrific, or was each battle its only nightmare? Or I think it means probably its, its, own, own, nightmare. its own nightmare. It's yeah. Nightmare. yeah. Um, I, I don't. I think each battle is its own nightmare, but some some nightmares are worse than others. And Antietam and Gettysburg, in the case of the Dawes, were two of the worst nightmares. Um, Fredericksburg um, was not as terrible as those other two battles. Chancellorsville wasn't as terrible as those two battles. But um, sometimes that's relative because let's say you were at Chancellorsville. This didn't happen to Dawes, but it could have happened to someone else. And you only lost 18 men, let's say, but one of the men killed was your best friend. Well, that mattered a lot to you. That, that battle, you'll never forget that battle because, you, and so one of the things about Antietam that, that really struck Dawes was one, the regiment lost a lot of men in the battle, 
but also he saw one of his best friends, Captain Edwin Brown, get killed. He got shot in the face when they were trying to get through the uh, garden at the David Miller farm. And he looked and he saw uh, Brown with his sword raised in his hand, shouting the command by the right file in the line, Company E, because that was the command they had to give to file through the garden because they couldn't tear the garden fence down. And he, he sees his friend, he shouts this command, he remembers it in his, in his memoir, Service with the Sixth Wisconsin, and then he sees him get killed. And um, that's a really, um, you know, for us today, when we read something like that, it's abstract to us because we didn't know Edwin Brown, we didn't know Rufus Dawes. But, um, you know, if you know people who are in the military today, who are in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or something like that, um, it's devastating when an, an, an event like that occurs and it, you don't ever forget it. So I, I think it's, again, it's relative. Uh, in a battle like Gettysburg, another thing that happened to Dawes is one of his uh, privates came up to him uh, during the fight at the railroad cut and he pulled open his uh, jacket and his shirt and he showed a bullet hole right in his chest. And he says, he says, Colonel, won't you tell my mother I died like a soldier and mm -hmm. fell dead at Dawes feet. Now Dawes, uh, after the fighting had subsided and the Sixth Wisconsin was in position on uh, Seminary Ridge, takes out his journal and he notes in his journal that Corporal Kelly said to me, tell my mother I died like a soldier. Mm -hmm. Now, why does Dawes do that? He does, he does that because he doesn't want to forget what Corporal Kelly said to him. He wants to remember that and document it. So he, he makes a note in the midst of the battle, even though it's a lull in the battle. Um, that says a lot about Dawes and how much he cares for his men. But it also says something about the, uh, the impact of the death of people like that upon uh, a caring person like Dawes was. <clears throat> he was caring. But it didn't mean that he wouldn't do his duty. He wouldn't expose soldiers to uh, to uh, grave danger, uh, which he did regularly. And and uh, but ultimately, um, it kind of you know it it gets the Dawes, and by they get time they get to Petersburg, he certainly is whether he has PTSD, combat fatigue, he he's got something, and uh, he resigns from the army and goes home. And uh, I think he just. He just couldn't do it anymore. He, he couldn't see the killing anymore. And he couldn't stand the fact that he himself seemed to survive all of this and all these people around him were killed. So anyway, I think it's uh, it's a long winded answer too. Uh, I think it depended upon the circumstances that some battles were obviously more horrific than others for you. And some battles because of the personal impact could be uh, really, really significant in your memory. So, so I'm gonna ask, oh, we can hear me. Ask both of you to, to reflect on the political meaning of Antietam. And uh, this is something that we talked about at the National Cemetery, I should say, the two of you uh, uh, spoke about. So could you reflect again upon the, the consequences, the significance? I think most of our uh, viewers have some sense of that and, and weave that into how that helps some of these men make meaning out of this, uh, you know, horrific bloodletting. So uh, Ashley, did you want to talk a little bit about that? And then we can turn it to Scott. Yeah. So this is, again, one of the things we did talk about at the cemetery, you know, when you're surrounded by all of these white tombstones, some of which are unknown, others have, have names. And a lot of the primary sources that we used for this tour excursion talked about just the horrific destructive nature of Antietam, the death, the scarring, the psychological trauma of it all. Um, but I think that we can't let that cloud our understanding of the good that came out of this battle for at least the Union Army um, in terms of how they they made meaning and they could they could derive meaning out of sacrifice and suffering because of course it, it's after this battle that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation Abraham Lincoln really commits to it. Um, this was seen as a, a victory enough for the Union Army that he thought that the you know he wouldn't look desperate by. Uh, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, which would go into effect January of 1863. He thought that he had the military backup, the political backup to put this into effect. Um, and so for, you know, these Union soldiers who had experienced this tremendous loss on this day and seeing their comrades shot down in these just horrific ways next to them, uh, all around them, they can find a higher purpose 
to that and say there, there was a reason for this, this advanced uh, the, the cause of, of the union. And of course, emancipation is initially seen as kind of a means to an end for a lot of soldiers, not necessarily the, the primary reason that they're fighting, but it's a, a way to defeat the Confederacy. Um, but it, it helped them justify some of that sacrifice and suffering and um, not so much get over it, but uh, find purpose for it. Yeah, it's, um, I think the you know, when we, when we look at the Emancipation Proclamation and we look at the aftermath of Antietam, uh, it's a very complicated story. It isn't, it isn't something that's simple. We can say, oh, everybody felt this way and everybody felt that way. Um, it, took, it really took time for Union and Confederate soldiers to come to grips with what they had experienced at Antietam. Uh, I think I mentioned in one video that, um, you know, most of these soldiers didn't consider the battle a victory or defeat. They, they tended to view it as just shocking. And uh, yeah, they were glad that the Confederates had retreated or some of the Confederates were glad that they had survived the battle. Um, but they also didn't, uh, they didn't lose heart in their cause. The Confederates certainly did not lose heart in their cause. One of the uh, mistakes some people make is the Confederate army suffered from massive straggling in the, in, the, in the Antietam campaign or Sharpsburg campaign. That wasn't because their heart wasn't in the cause. It was because they didn't have any food. Their clothing was falling off of them. They were just at the end of their tether. They just couldn't keep up anymore. They, they, they just had enough. So they, and they were able to straggle. It was easy to straggle. And they'd been at Second Manassas or they'd been at Gaines Mill or Cedar Mountain or whatever. They didn't want to do it again. So they, there was tremendous straggling, but there wasn't um, I don't believe in what I'm fighting for. They did believe in the cause they were fighting for. And for Union soldiers, um, one of the narratives that I've found is very common is that the Army of the Potomac generally uniformly did not support emancipation. I don't find that to be true at all. Uh, if you were a Republican in the Army of the Potomac, you probably supported Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. If you were a Democrat in the Army of the Potomac, you may not have. But you also may have been like Francis Donaldson, who was a captain in the 118th Pennsylvania, and he didn't agree with Lincoln's policy one bit. But he said, as long as there is a rebel in arms, I will serve my country and die if necessary to preserve the nation. So here's a man, I think he's kind of representative of the war Democrats in the army. I don't necessarily like this policy, but I'll tolerate the policy because I don't believe what the Confederacy is doing is legal and right. And I think we need to unify the nation again and I'm gonna, and I'll fight and die for it. So um, they're all over the map. If you look at Rufus Dawes and look through his book in January of 1863, he goes home on leave and they ask him to come and speak in Marietta, Ohio at uh, town hall and all these people pour in to listen to him. And he talks about the Emancipation Proclamation in there. And he talks about why the soldiers in the army like the Emancipation Proclamation. Of course, he's not speaking for everybody. He's speaking for some of the army. But um, it's, it's worth reading to see what Dawes has to say, because it kind of corrects the narrative that we get that there's a lot of backlash to the Emancipation Proclamation. And we also need to take the context, uh, look at the context. So when the Army of the Potomac fights the Battle of Fredericksburg, which is this disastrous battle, and they feel they've been sacrificed in this battle, that starts to turn some soldiers who were maybe ambivalent about emancipation against it, because they see that they're, they're not being used properly. They're being sacrificed. They don't like why they're being sacrificed. But when you start to get towards Gettysburg, you see a swing back the other way. So I think it moves. It's not just, it's not, um, it's not static and everybody doesn't have one opinion and they all stick to that opinion. I think opinions evolve based upon experiences that they have. I just want to just add to that, that the one thing that we tend to emphasize because of the important scholarship really beginning with Joe Glattar on his book on Sherman's Men to the Sea and Beyond and followed up by Earl Hess and then James McPherson, but we focus on McPherson and why they fought and the importance of ideology, which is obviously is undeniable. But that emphasis on, on ideology it also, uh, I think leads us to, to give soldiers on both sides too much agency. And so as they voice their opinions about whether they favor emancipation or not, whether the union war effort has been perverted or uplifted, we need to remind ourselves 
they didn't have a hell of a lot of choice mm -hmm. and they knew they didn't have a lot of choice. Right. And so time and time again, when we look at, for example, at Lee's army after Sharpsburg, and yes, I think Scott is correct, correct is that the logistical breakdown certainly was behind a lot of the, uh, of the desertion. Uh, and then many of the men still had a belief in the cause. But if you in fact question the cause, Again, what options did you have? Right. <laughs> you're, stuck, you're stuck in the ranks. So, right. you know, I think that that's, I think that's crucial. The other thing that I would stress is that what the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, I think we should be clear about that because the official emancipation, not till January 1st, there was a lot still hanging in the balance. And there was, in fact, you know, um, possibility that Lincoln would have actually rescinded the preliminary. And I think it goes to show that the, official issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st in the wake of Fredericksburg was still a bold political move on Lincoln's part, no doubt about that. And then the final thing I'll say about the preliminary emancipation, if there was a white Southerner who had any doubts about Abraham Lincoln's intentions, if they thought that just maybe he could be friendly toward the white South, the preliminary emancipation confirmed what so many other Southerners were saying, that Republicans like Lincoln were nothing more than they were wolves hiding in sheep's clothing. They were abolitionists from the beginning. And you look at Jefferson Davis's response to the Emancipation Proclamation, and he is not engaging in, I think, just a rhetorical war here. He is very convinced, as many other white Southerners, that this is going to be the first step toward widespread slave insurrection, that we're going to have the kinds of insurrections that was found in the Caribbean. So what happened after the, after Antietam, it made it abundantly clear that these were two societies and they're going to be fighting to the death. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's now it's crystallized, right? There's right. no, there's absolutely no going back. Mm -hmm. Although Lincoln could have pulled back from the preliminary if he wanted to, mm -hmm. he could, he could have, he mm -hmm. could have done. Uh, done just Although that. Confederates didn't necessarily think that this would sink their cause. I mean, they were certainly suspicious right. that this could sink the Union cause as well. And there was a lot of crowing about that, that right. this might turn a lot of people right. against Lincoln to, to really put emancipation into the mix. That's right. um, so there's, yeah, a range even among it, it, you, No, you're exactly right. It, it's not going to undermine Confederate morale, right? right? It's yeah. going to embitter some, it's going right. to inflame yeah. others. But, you know, as I think Scott and both of you are pointing to, the responses are so incredibly diverse. And a book that I'd like to recommend, I'm sure many of you have read, General Lee's Army by Joseph Glattar. I mentioned Gl Joe's first work. He did, again, pioneering work on soldier studies. Uh, this is, in my estimation, the most important secondary source on Lee's Army. There is not even a close second. It embodies all of the uh, practices of social history, but it is centered within the military story. General Lee's Army, I can't say enough good things mm -hmm. about it. And it uh, speaks to a lot of the topics that you yeah. have both uh, both addressed. Please. Yeah, he has some uh, he has uh, some chapters in there that are really relevant to the Antietam campaign, and um, the the problem of poor discipline. And he, one of the things that's unusual about the Army of Northern Virginia is they have extremely poor march discipline, extremely good battle discipline. Um, he uh, he also uh, gets into the period after the Battle of Antietam, which is really really interesting. And when Lee is attempting to rebuild his army, because his army was really mauled in the battle, far worse than what uh, what is generally believed, and um, he's able to rebuild it. Uh, if you look at the uh, strength returns for that army that they come out three times a month, it is unbelievable how they build the army back up. It also speaks to one of the failures of McClellan, which was to, he let Lee just rebuild his army. He didn't, um, he didn't press him. He let Lee gather his supplies at the, uh, the upper end of the Shenandoah Valley. He let Lee gather his stragglers. He let Lee get all of his sick and wounded evacuated out of the area and absorb all of his conscripts and return wounded from the Peninsula and Manassas campaigns that just rebuild his army. And uh, for a few weeks there after the Battle of Antietam, Lee's army was very vulnerable, but his strategy was pretty smart. He adopted a bold strategy and in, in the hopes that it might intimidate McClellan into thinking that the Confederates were stronger than they were. And it worked because McClellan did think that they were stronger than they were. Even though McClellan had a lot of intelligence that could have told him otherwise, um, he tended to seek out that intelligence that confirmed what he wanted to believe about the Army of Northern Virginia. And Scott and Ashley can both comment on this. Um, 
Scott and I were talking over a Danish this morning <laughs> that, uh, you know, you look at, uh, we'll, we'll take Barksdale's brigade. Um, Jim Murray did a tour for us yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the brigades casually is percent was in the 50% range. Yeah, yeah. 50%. Right. Yeah. And Barksdale, of course, is mortally wounded. And the brigade and Barksdale at that time, and really even today, they're sort of heralded. And both you and I said, man, it's 50% casualties. If you had an officer today that skewed it, uh, endured 50% casualties, yeah, they'd be cashiered. That'd be it, right? Mm -hmm. That'd be done. So I want both of you to think about this. The casualties at least sustained percentage-wise, roughly, Scott, what did he probably lose from his army? Percentage-wise. At Antietam, yeah. uh, he lost over 30% yeah, of his 30%, army. over 30%, right? Of the whole army. Yeah, the whole army. Yeah. And so I guess the first question would be, were there any criticisms out there? Because when we think about what could have been achieved, why he was emphatic in staying on Maryland soil, which we know there's some strategic political goals yeah. here to be to mm -hmm. be attained. We get that. Right. But at the end of the day, right, what was possible, what was achievable, what was realistic when you got a small force that's unraveling in Virginia because of straggling and logistical breakdown, you persist, you continue to fight. Not only did he do it for those two days. We should note that when he gets his army back into Virginia, he seriously contemplated recrossing the Potomac and fighting again. So yeah. should there be a reevaluation here of R.E. Lee when we think again of the overall strategic pressures placed upon the Confederacy, namely manpower, when we think about that moment, what his army could have reasonably uh, 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 you know, uh, accomplished, should there be a reevaluation of Lee's generalship here? Well, I think you're you're getting at Lee's Achilles heel, uh, and Lee's Achilles heel was a uh, um, it was also one of his strengths. It was um, he never thought anything was not attainable, so that's what helped him take a lot of risks that worked out for him. But I think in the in the in the Maryland campaign, after the Battle of Antietam is over, despite there's abundant evidence around him that his army is really in a shambles. Um, I don't think Lee still at that point really understood how bad off his army was. And it was the it was the action at Shepherdstown that really made it clear to Lee how bad it was because the two brigades that they left to guard the reserve artillery that was defending Butler's Ford, uh, Armistead's brigade and Douglas's brigade or Lawton's brigade, both of those brigades only had about 300 men in them. That's a brigade. They had about 300 men left in them. So they're demoralized. They've lost most of their officers. Um, they, their morale just was not high. And they ended up, um, when the Federals got across the, uh, across the river uh, on the 19th, they ended up fleeing uh, to the rear. Not because they were bad units. They just, uh, uh, the guys were at the end of their tether and they felt they were being overwhelmed and they took off. And I think Lee really realized when he sought out a unit to counterattack, he didn't have any except AP Hill. That was the only division that he really had that was capable of carrying out the counterattack that they did on the 20th. And it was to uh, Lee's benefit that Hill executed that so well. And Fitz John Porter managed the defense on the federal side poorly even though on the day before, Fitz John Porter's crossing of the Potomac was textbook. I mean, it was perfect. But his uh, on the 20th, I don't think he did a very good job in managing that defense. But A.P. Hill defeats uh, the crossing of the Potomac. And that really intimidated the Federals into thinking that the Confederates were pretty strong. But the only unit that could have executed that, that attack, that counterattack, was A.P. Hill's division. The rest of the divisions of the Army were in such poor condition that executing an attack against that type of federal artillery that uh, Porter had massed in that area, I, I don't think that would have succeeded. And Lee, he's thinking in terms of, yeah, I've crossed the river, I'm gonna go back in. I think after that uh, engagement realizes this army is not in, if you read his correspondence, it's pretty clear. He realizes then his army is not in any condition to undertake any sort of offensive action. So he is not gonna try to engage the federals anymore He's just going to try to rebuild his army, but keep the Federals off balance. So I think, um, you know, again, Lee, we saw it at Gettysburg when Lee overreaches in making Pickett's charge. This is Achilles, Lee's Achilles heel that uh, particularly at this point in the war, 62, 63, he takes a lot of risks that um, in one sense I understand, but in other senses, like when Pete's asking, 
what is what can Lee attain by fighting a battle at Sharpsburg? That is, I think, a really legitimate question to ask that Lee probably should have been asking himself, and I'm sure he did ask himself. But Lee's always an opportunist, and you're fighting George McClellan. McClellan was a cautious commander. And if you were able to defeat McClellan's attack, what do you think McClellan might do? Well, he might fall back to South Mountain and take up a defensive position. You're still in Maryland. You still have the initiative. You can bring up your you know, convalescent, uh, sick and wounded and so on, your conscripts. You can rebuild your army. Maybe you can move up towards Hagerstown. You keep the war north of the Potomac and all the political things are gonna fall in your favor you're gonna take that risk to fight the Battle of Sharpsburg. Probably wasn't a good risk for Lee to take, but I think we can understand maybe why he did it. Yeah, I think Lee Lee always has in the back of his mind that the clock is, is ticking um, somewhat for the Confederacy that because of the amount of manpower and the amount of resources that they have, um, that he's gotta get that decisive blow and he's gotta get it quickly because if the Confederacy just drags out, drags out for years and years, he's just gonna be you know, sapped of, of strength, uh, of numbers, of resources, civilian morale is going to, you know, go down as well. Um, so I think that's always in the back of his mind when he he goes for that, searches for that, you know, the battle of annihilation, um, or has perhaps too much confidence in his men, is that he's thinking, well, if I don't go for it now, and just let things drag on, I'm going to end up in maybe the same position, if not worse, if I just turned around and tried to refight it again and lose more men that way. Um, and so I think that's why he's always he's always looking uh, to, to yeah. issue the knockout punch. Yeah, yeah. Ashley, I think you're exactly right. As a, a big picture continues to, to guide him. Uh, two other books. I'm going to I didn't finish my little thing or well, whatever. Sorry. So I've just pushed, pushed the two books. If you just go in. Can you get my little thing there? I, I think these are underappreciated books on the Maryland campaign. I've just posted them. Uh, Joseph Harsh, who was a longtime professor at uh, George Mason. Here you go, Ashley. Uh, I, I, I don't know, and obviously Scott's very familiar mm -hmm. with this. This leads up uh, to the Maryland campaign. I think it's a fantastic That's book. a great. It's a great, a great. It's one of the best military histories period that I've ever read. Yeah. Uh, I never, I didn't get to meet Joe before he passed, but yeah, really one of the best, I think one of the best analysis yeah. of Robert E. Lee's yes, generalship yeah. and his strategic thinking. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then followed by this, which uh, taken at the flood, the second volume, he was going to do three, I believe, I might be mistaken right. by that, that he passed before he could finish mm -hmm. that. He and uh, many of you know, uh, uh, the late Dick Summers, he and Dick Summers were good friends. They were Vandiver students uh, at uh, Texas A&M, Texas I believe, right? So mm -hmm. two excellent books. Mm -hmm. I believe they're still in print, both Kent State University, mm -hmm. and absolutely worth your time. I think that's kind of a wrap for us. Uh, I just uh, want to again thank Scott and, and Ashley. Uh, we have, like I said, a memorable day. Uh, it was just, well, you just saw us. I mean, we looked kind of miserable, at least at first, but man, it, once we got going out there and got to, to listen and have we that conversation. We were warmed up by Scott, history. <laughs> and warmed up by history, absolutely. Yeah. We were. And great to have our students out there, Cameron and Ben, and uh, they did a fantastic job. They did four years for us that were great. And again, I just will make one final plug. And those students, you saw what they could do. And it was because we gave them those opportunities that they had on the battlefield and in the park service last summer, uh, they worked at Fredericksburg National Military Park. So again, if you uh, find it uh, within I'll your heart, the link please do it. One post more the time, link. That would be one fantastic. more time. <laughs> but we're hoping to see you all in October for our North Carolina at Gettysburg uh, mini conference. And the three of us will be there. Ashley will be doing Iverson's Brigade. Scott, you and I are going to do Cemetery Hill and uh, Culpsville, Hill, yeah, right. which will yeah. be fun. We'll do yeah. that. Maybe we even, well, we lean, I lean on Scott a lot. I say a few things and then Scott comes in and very nicely sort of <laughs> cracks things uh, very nicely, very gently. So we'll see you all in October. And then, of course, don't forget. That 2022, we won't be fussing with Zoom, right? Yes. No more, no. no more. We will not do no it. More. We'll be back live in person. We've got a fantastic lineup. Y'all need to just go and look at our webpage. I, I just, I, I have to just remind everyone: if you're thinking about October, remember next week we will remind some of the hotels in the area that they agreed to have blocks of rooms for y'all, and you need to get it now because October is 
it's just crazy. Really I think it's out. extra busy this year this because is, of the pandemic. Extra, Everything's yeah. been pushed back mm -hmm. and everything is happening yeah. all at once. All the in October. Time. Yeah. For those of you who have not been to CWI Live, I really encourage you to come. Uh, it is a great place, uh, wonderful people, wonderful fellowship. It's just, it's really a lot of fun. And you get a chance to meet a lot of the professors or mm -hmm. faculty members. We do dine-in, dine so you can sign up and have lunch with one of the faculty members. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, I mean, watching us eat is not very exciting, right? No, especially <laughs> when we're trying to juggle primary source documents <laughs> and facilitate a discussion. Yeah. But yeah. Well, as long as I get my blueberry tangerine salad, I'll be happy. <laughs> Right. And Scott will have his Napa chicken almond salad. All right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Ashley, have I forgotten anything else here? No. I don't think so. I think you've covered it all. Well, the last thing I'll say is a big thank you to her. She's been fantastic, yeah. right? She's done a lot of the technical stuff for us and organized mm -hmm. things. She's just the first rate. And obviously, you can see, you know, what is her day job it is being a historian. And she's very good at it. So, again, appreciate what everyone has done. I appreciate you all coming as well. Miss seeing you all. And uh, drop us a line if you're passing through Gettysburg. I'm up for a, a salad, a blueberry tangerine salad at the Panera anytime. So, yeah. or no, at Reliance Mind Saloon. That's Scott, right. have you ever been to Reliance Mind Saloon? It's been a while. It's, it's been, been a while. while. It's been a while. I think we need to get it's you back out, man. Yeah. I love Reliance Mind Saloon. Right. It's got character. It's got character. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. <laughs> all right, y'all. Take good care of yourselves. All right. We miss you all. Thank you. Have all. a good yeah. summer. Bye -bye. Stay safe.